All right, so this is me. Uh, I'm Jeff Smith. Uh, I did indeed uh, do my graduate work here from 1985 to 1996. Don't do this at home. Uh, but it turned out OK, even though I spent 12 years getting my PhD. So I actually had a friend from undergrad days who had, eh, I don't know, a dozen or so friends of his who were all starting PhD programs around the same time. And he had a contest. He said, the first of you who finishes their PhD, I will take out to a nice dinner. I won the contest. <laughs> uh, because 10 of the people didn't finish, and the other person finished a month after me. Anyway. Um, yeah, so be glad when you finish in six on time. So I'm going to do two somewhat different things today. Uh, the first lecture is going to be on heterogeneous treatment effects, which is something that I like and which I started thinking about when I was here in graduate school. Excuse me. Uh, this lecture includes a lot of my current uh, kind of little ranting hobby horse things that hopefully you will enjoy. The second half after the break, and this lecture actually may slop past the break because it tends to run a little longer than the other lecture, uh, is on um, experiments as benchmarks. So there's a literature that uses randomized controlled trials uh, to study the performance of alternative non-experimental identification and estimation strategies. And it's a literature that I've participated in, as you may know. And I think that literature is very interesting, too. Uh, and so the second part, we'll kind of walk through some of that literature and, and try to synthesize it a little bit in a way that is not so present in the current published parts of that literature. Uh, you should feel free, of course, to interrupt, to ask questions, to make comments, and so on. This is Chicago, after all. Don't be shy. Uh, and that makes it more interesting for me, of course, than just standing up and talking. What happened to the, oh, that's very odd. All right, I had a, I think I, all right, now I know which. Okay, I had a slide, which is now gone about my research interests, so let me say a little bit about those. Um, a lot of them are methodological in, within treatment effect land, or even broader than treatment effect land. Uh, I have a bunch of papers on experiments. Uh, I have a bunch of papers on kind of matching and other estimators that build on conditional independence. Um, both those lines of work date back to graduate school. I have a later set of papers, a smaller set of papers on regression discontinuity uh, with Dan Black and co-authors. And uh, I just generally often find when I read papers that my mind goes naturally to the methodological aspects in a very broad sense. I, I also am very interested in measurement issues and things like that that economists oftentimes aren't so interested in. Uh, in terms of substantive areas, most of my papers are about active labor market programs. And indeed, I'm going to frame the discussion of heterogeneous treatment effects that we are about to endure uh, in the context of active labor market programs, although it's more general. Uh, active labor market programs is a European term for what is called employment and training programs or job training programs in the US. Uh, the Europeans like to talk about activating the unemployed. Uh, as opposed to letting them just be passive and receive checks. And I always imagine taking the unemployed and putting their finger in a socket. That's my model of activation. Uh, probably shouldn't be your model. Anyway, so I have a lot of papers about that uh, and uh, various aspects of that problem of how to run and design these active labor market programs. And then I have a second research agenda, also that started in graduate school, although not with Heckman on college quality, the effects of the quality of the post-secondary institution that you attend uh, on your labor market outcomes. And more recently, with my student, uh, Nora Dillon, some papers on mismatch, college mismatch, which we think about, we frame as heterogeneous effects of college quality, where the heterogeneity depends on the relationship between your ability, the student's ability, and the quality of the college. So that's what I do. If you want to talk at the break or at lunch uh, about those things, I'd be delighted to do that. Unfortunately, because the movers appear at my house tomorrow, uh, so I'm not starting at Wisconsin until January, but the family is moving this weekend, uh, I'm leaving right after lunch. So 
I apologize for that. I, I really enjoy these, these HCEO courses, and I like to stay around longer and meet the students, because that's most of the fun. So if you're interested in talking to me after the lectures this morning, uh, and grab me at, during the break or at lunch, because that's your chance. Um, I was going to say, oh yeah. So here's the outline of the lecture. Start with notation. Talk about parameters of interest. That's kind of obligatory in treatment effects land. Most of you will have seen that stuff before. I'm going to kind of gloss over the experiments require assumptions parts in the interest of time, and then go right into um, the discussion of heterogeneous treatment effects, which I will motivate with a very simple model of participation and outcomes in active labor market programs. Uh, Chris Tabor likes to say that Wisconsin is a department of people who care about models, which is a, an interesting description that I like. Not a structural department. He distinguishes structural department from a department of people who care about models. So we're going to try to care about models today uh, within the context of a general discussion in the treatment effects tradition. So there you go, wedding the perhaps unwettable, but I don't think they are unwettable. Then if we have time, we'll say a bunch about external validity. We will defer experiments as benchmarks till the next lecture, and then maybe say a little bit about general equilibrium treatment effects. All right, so this is the Mill, Frost, Fisher, Name, and Roy Quant, Rubin potential outcomes framework. So you all may know that uh, Mr. Heckman and Mr. Rubin don't get on too well. So Mr. Rubin is the poobah of treatment effects in the statistics world, Don Rubin. He's a very smart man. Uh, and he likes, if you're, if you're one of his students, you call this the Rubin causal model, RCM. Uh, if you are a statistician who is not one of his students, you call this the Neyman Rubin model. And if you're a Heckman student, you call it the Milfrost, Fisher, Neyman, Roy Quant Rubin model uh, to emphasize <laughs> how completely unoriginal it is, I guess. Uh, so I'll leave that with you. Uh, you know, academics uh, can be something at times. Anyway, um, you've seen this notation before, but it's important to think about it. And it's kind of, there is a contribution here just in thinking about this notation, right? There's a treated outcome and there's an untreated outcome. Y1 is the treated outcome, Y0 is the untreated outcome. We're thinking about a binary treatment. All the kind of stuff that we're going to talk about can be generalized to cases of multivalued treatments or with a bit more difficulty, continuous treatments. We're going to do the binary case to focus on the key methodological issues. And the idea is here, we're going to be assuming, until the discussion of general equilibrium effects, we're going to be assuming what's called SUTVA in the statistics literature, so the stable unit treatment value assumption. Not a real attractive phraseology, but there it is. And the idea is that each person has a Y1 and a Y0 that's kind of permanently theirs. You have your treated outcome, you have your untreated outcome, and they are invariant under SITVA to what everybody else does. Who else gets treated, how they get treated, blah, 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 blah. They're just yours. And of course, we only ever observe one of them, right? Either you get treated or you don't get treated. You go to graduate school at Chicago or you go to graduate school at Harvard. You marry person A, you marry person B. Whatever it is, Right? We observe that outcome. We don't observe the other. And so the problem is always if we want to estimate the effect of going to grad school at Chicago instead of going to grad school at Harvard, we have to do something to impute that missing counterfactual. I'm going to use D as an indicator for participation in treatment. Which letter you use for participation in treatment actually is a, is a clue to who your dissertation advisor was or sort of what part of this tradition you you are in, some people use T, some people use other things. D is kind of the Heckman, the Heckman symbol for treatment. And I'm going to use R as an indicator for randomization into a treatment group in an experiment, because experiments are going to be lurking in the background for some of what we do. All right, you probably all know this too, but just in case, because I gather this is a relatively disciplinary, a relatively heterogeneous group in terms of disciplines. So in particular, if you are not an economist and I start to use econ babble, you should raise your hand and I will translate. All right, so treatment of the treated is the thing we're usually most interested in. That's what you want for a simple cost-benefit analysis that's aimed at answering the question of keep the program as it currently exists or scrap it. That's not always an interesting policy question, but often is. So that's the expected difference in the treated outcome for the treated units and the expected outcome the untreated outcome for the treated units. This part's easy, right? We can just measure the treated outcome for the treated units because they got treated. The hard part is 
this thing over here, what would the average untreated outcome have been for the treated units? And this whole literature is all about different ways to get that thing by hammering on data on people who choose not to participate, basically. Or if you do an experiment, you directly produce this by forcing some d equals 1 units chosen at random to experience the untreated outcome. Right? There are people who wanted to be treated. They showed up to the program. They applied. They were determined to be eligible. And you broke their hearts by randomly assigning them to the control group just so that you could get a credible estimate of that. And so in an experiment, you compare, right? You have d equals 1 units. They all wanted to be treated. You compare the treatment group units r equals 1 to the control group units r equals 0. All right, you probably already knew all that stuff. Maybe you haven't seen this before. So this is a simple model. I like this phrase that I got from Costas McGeer. I don't know if it's original to him. Models are useful to help us organize our thinking. So I want to help us organize our thinking by thinking about a very simple model of program participation and outcomes. As I mentioned, I'm going to frame this in terms of a job training program, but it's, it's pretty general. And uh, I think that will be clear. The model comes originally from Heckman and Robb, 1985, which if you hadn't read it, is a truly masterful summary of sort of everything that was in Jim's head 30 years ago. And there was a lot of stuff in there. Uh, he had, that paper anticipates a lot of what happened in the literature, the subsequent treatment effects literature. Uh, it's, worth, it's worth your time. It is long. It's like 100 pages, but, uh, but it's worth your time. We reprised the model in the Handbook of Labor Economics chapter uh, in 1999, and then I reprised it again in my Handbook of the Economics of Education chapter with my Michigan colleague Brian McCall and, uh, and Connie Wood, uh, who was uh, a student of my friend Michael Lechner. So we have uh, an outcome model here, outcome equation. It's additively separable. It's linear. Again, we're being very simple here, right? There's a lot of substance already just in writing the outcomes this way, separating out all the x's, blah, blah, blah. This is the observation equation, if you will, written in the form of a switching regression. So if you're treated, we observe y1. If you're not treated, we observe y0. This is one point where the sort of active labor market program context comes in, we're going to assume, or I'm going to assume, that if you choose to be treated, that your outcome in the first period is zero. Then that reflects you're in the training program, right? It's just like if we're thinking about the decision to go to college or not, right? part of the price of college is the opportunity cost. You take yourself out of the labor market, or generally at least out of the full-time labor market when you go to college. Your friends who opt to go into the labor market right after high school are presumably going to earn more than you do while you're working at Starbucks as a student. And so you get the classic kind of becker mincer graph where the people who stop at high school initially are above, but they're eventually overtaken by the people who decide to go to college who make an investment that has an initial opportunity cost and a later payoff. Same idea here. So we got a bunch of conditioning variables here. I'm going to talk about the role that they play as we go forward. We have a treatment effect here. Now, I want to highlight something, which is that little i subscript. So in a sense, much of the methodological literature in treatment effects land over the last 25 years, over the time since I was a graduate student, is dealing with the idea that this thing might have an i subscript. Right? It seems trivial, just a little i there. But what does it mean? It says people might have different effects of the same treatment. Right? Or it could be, and this is often empirically the case, that the thing that we are representing with our binary indicator D is itself heterogeneous. Right? So if we think about an active labor market program in the US, say the Workforce Investment Act, or presently the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, you could go in and apply to that program, and you might get training in being a hairstylist, or in Microsoft Office, or in being a welder. The standard analysis of the effect of those programs is going to call all those different kinds of training D is equal to 1. Well, OK, in some sense, they all are the same thing. They're vocational training, probably six months or shorter, aimed at improving your earnings and employment outcomes. But at the same time, they're different. 
And so when we think about beta D having an I subscript, some of that may be that D is actually not homogeneous, but we're pretending it is. Some of it may be that two different individuals may react differently to exactly the same treatment. Right? We will see this today. Some of you will really like this lecture and other people will not like it as much, right? You're all getting the same lecture, but people react differently. This is very true in medicine as well, perhaps surprisingly, that you can give people the same pill. Some people get better, some people get sick. Uh, that's interesting and useful. So up until kind of 1990-ish, the literature implicitly assumed there was no I subscript here. There was just the treatment effect, the effect of such and such program. And you can still read a lot of papers in a lot of parts of economics, less so in labor economics, that talk about the effect of something as if it had no I subscript. For me, I've trained myself, it's kind of like a red light flashes whenever I'm reading a paper and it starts talking about the effect of something. Uh, I get irritated and I scribble something about what if the effect is different across different units. That's pretty important. And of course, that's what this lecture is about, is heterogeneous treatment effects. That this turns out to matter substantively and econometrically. Uh, my favorite example, and I'm already starting to ramble, which is a bad thing, but is this book called The Case for Marriage, by, written by a famous demographer called Linda Waite and a journalist called something Gallagher. And this book was a little controversial. It was originally going to be published by Harvard University Press, and then they canceled it, supposedly, because they didn't like the policy conclusions in the last chapter, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, Linda Waite used to be here at the, at the Harris School. The book does the following. It has a bunch of chapters. Each chapter is basically a literature survey on the treatment effect, the literature on the treatment effect of marriage in a particular outcome domain. So there's a literature on the effect of marriage on labor market outcomes. There's a literature on the effect of marriage on health outcomes, blah, 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 blah. Some of these literatures are done by economists. Some of them are done by psychologists and other people. It's very interesting to compare across the chapters to see what different disciplines think is compelling evidence. That's the first thing that makes this interesting. The second thing that makes it interesting, which is relevant to my point here, is that then you get to the last chapter, which is the policy chapter. And the policy chapter says, well, look, we've just done this literature review. We've shown you that the effect of marriage on all these things that we like is positive. Therefore, basically, everyone should get married. Now, OK, if there is no I subscript here, I am with you. right? If there is an I subscript on the treatment effect of marriage, then what we've done is we've surveyed a bunch of literatures on the effect of treatment on the treated, essentially, the effect of marriage on the married. And if people have any idea of what their effect of marriage is, then the ones who anticipate a positive effect of marriage are going to sort into being married. And the ones who realize that they'd be a disastrous spouse are not going to sort into marriage. Right? And so that's a context where you might imagine that the effect of treatment on the treated might be quite different than the average effect of treatment on the non-treated. There is nothing about that in this whole book. No recognition that marriage might have heterogeneous treatment effects, just kind of rah-rah marriage. And marriage is lovely if, if you have a positive treatment effect. I don't want to diss on marriage, but I don't think everybody does. And so this is not some crazy uncommon thing about obscure people, right? So Linda Waite is really seriously a big deal demographer who's written a lot of very nice papers. But this particular book and the literature on which it builds does not reflect an understanding of the importance of that I subscript. So that's why we're doing this talk today. Yes, sir? Um, what about the T subscript? So you set this up in a way that the Ah, good question. Good question. So let me talk about that. That's a very good question. So this original model, the one that I'm doing today, is going to assume away the problem of the timing of participation in the training program. Right? We're not assuming away the, the idea that outcomes, treatment effects may vary in relative time after you take the program. That's a different issue. But we're going to assume that, or I'm going to assume, that the program is only offered in period K. 
which means I shouldn't have k subscripts on the x's probably, but there's one period, period k, that's the period when the program is available, you take it or not in that period and that's it. In the McCall, Smith, and Winchambo chapter, we generalize and talk about the dynamics of deciding when to get treated, but that complicates things a lot, because then you're off in dynamic discrete choice land and blah, 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 that's all good stuff, but that would take us away from where I want us to go today. No, so the T is, yeah, so well, think about that K as being, uh, I don't know, cap L or something. For the, that's, the, that's the dimensionality of the X vector. Whereas T runs from 1 to cap T, and somewhere between 1 and cap T is this period K. And in period K, the opportunity to take training becomes available. Right? And then we could also worry, which I'm not going to do here, about whether or not the agents know that period K is coming or whether it's just a sudden shock of, oh, here's this new program that you never knew about before. Um, I'm going to abstract from that, too. But that's another thing you can think about. Because in certain versions of this model, agents might actually want to take actions in advance, blah, 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 blah. So I'm not going to go there. Program just appears suddenly in period K. People choose in a sort of static way to participate or not in that period based on the discounted stream of anticipated future treatment effects and untreated outcomes. Period. Does that answer your question? You're I think so. I'm just still trying to figure out the D, I, T, if we could drop that subscript. Oh, we could get rid of the T subscript on the D. Yes, because here there's only one shot, period K, to take training. Yes. Okay. But I want it. See, if I think about having data, a panel data set, right, then, then I want to keep the T subscript because for the treated units, D, I, T is equal to zero from period one to period K minus one, and then it switches to one in period K and stays one until period cap T. Whereas for the untreated units, DIT is zero at every period. That's the sense of having the T subscript there. You can make a lot of headway in economics by just paying close attention to subscripts. Probably you've already sorted this out. But, uh, and the other way of putting that is when you write papers, you need to think very hard about your subscripts. Okay. I think I've said all this stuff. I said that, said that. Uh, oh, there's this fixed effect here. This is important too. Uh, so eta i deliberately has no t subscript. This is a time invariant feature of individuals that affects their outcomes. So people sometimes call it ability, right? That gets an economist into trouble. It's just the time invariant component of outcomes. And one thing that this literature has thought about and that other literatures think about is to what extent is the selection problem due to a correlation between A to I and D? And to what extent is it due to correlation between epsilon IT, which is the transitory shock, and D? <clears throat> and you can tell kind of different stories about those two things. Excuse me. If people who are persistently worse off in a way that they know and you may know only partially as the observing applied econometrician, that's a different story than people selecting the treatment because they had a bad transitory shock, like a job loss. But otherwise, the people who select in are kind of just like, in terms of their permanent component, the people who don't select in. Right? Those are different stories. Yes? Um, all the covariates are either time variant or measured before, okay? Uh, yes. Yeah, I should probably say that, but they don't. We also have a participation equation. So this is a standard kind of latent index model that in you know, the olden days would motivate running a probit. Uh, and if you can, you can see the Heckman bivariate normal selection model lurking in the back here too, if you like. Uh, we're not going to go down that road today, but that's a fine road. So there's a latent index that reflects the net utility from treatment, and that index is called DI star. That's perhaps a little awkward since DI star is continuous, and you might think that D stands for dummy, which I think is the original intention. Um, there's three things in the participation equation. You could also have X's in here if you wanted to. The first thing is the direct cost of participation, right? I have to drive to the training center or I have to somehow get myself to the training center or not. That's a direct cost of participating in the training. There is the opportunity cost of training, and that should have a K subscript on it, right? So I assume that in the period of training, in period K, <coughs> if you get the training, you get zero earnings, right? Because you're busy learning. And so the opportunity cost is what I would have gotten in the labor market had I not decided to get treatment in that period, in period K. 
And then the individual specific treatment effect, right? And this is what you don't see. This is sort of what is a bit unique about this particular model is explicitly putting the individual treatment effect into the participation equation. Now, if the treatment effects are homogeneous, big deal, right? That's just part of the intercept. But if the treatment effects are heterogeneous, then this is potentially very important. Uh, so I already talked about that. I talked about that. We know from Ed Vitlicil's dissertation that this is essentially equivalent. This model is kind of isomorphic to the monotonicity slash local average treatment effect framework of Engrist, Immens, and Rubin. Right? And that's kind of easy to see here with the latent index. All right. Blah, 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 blah. So this question, right? So we stuck the treatment effect in here. But in fact, not only does the observing social scientists not know the treatment effect, probably individuals don't actually know their treatment effect either, though they may have more information about it than the observing social scientist. They may have biased ideas about it relative to the observing social scientist. This is an area of research that I think is really under, under engaged, is trying to figure out what people know when they make decisions. Um, you know, Jim has done some work with other students about this in the context of post-secondary enrollment, right? So how, how much do people know about their treatment effect from going to college? But there's really little of this. Uh, there's a little bit of evidence about caseworkers, right? So somebody did an experiment called the AFDC Homemaker Home Health Aid Experiment. Uh, this was implemented by Apt Associates, which is one of the big evaluation consulting firms. And they asked all the caseworkers prior to random assignment, so these were women on welfare. Um, AFDC was aid to families to dependent with dependent children, the predecessor to the current Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, or TANF program. They asked each caseworker, do you think this person will benefit a lot from the program or not? And, uh, you know, the caseworkers said yes for some and no for others. When they came to analyze the results from the randomized control trial, they interacted the treatment indicator with the caseworker estimates of what the treatment effect would be. And the coefficient on that interaction term was zero. So not just statistically zero, just substantively zero. Uh, so it seems that the caseworkers, whose job supposedly in part is to steer people into treatments that are going to have positive treatment effects on them, had no idea which, which participants were going to have big treatment effects or not. Anyway, I, this is a, there's going to be a bunch of pitches in here for different kinds of research that one might do, things I think are understudied. I've reached a point in my career where I had this very long list of papers that I want to write, and that list is longer than the time till when I retire. And so now I just kind of fling paper ideas out and hope that people will write the paper so that I can just read them instead of having to write them. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice place in your career. Yes? I guess I'm wondering what sort of empirical research could you do then on identifying people's uncertainty about their treatment effect? Right, like, so you can imagine you could assume that the variance of treatment effect itself might be representative of their uncertainty, but that's a pretty strong. That is a very strong assumption, I agree. <laughs> and so I'm, not, I'm wondering uh, conceptually, how would you start to go about that? You're going to have to sit down and talk to people, right? I mean, that, that's kind of job one here. And, it, and that means probably designing your own and implementing your own survey, which is hard. So you can see why economists haven't done a lot of this. Maybe the sociologists should be doing it. Um, they're more into that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's, there's reasons people haven't done it. But I think it's a, nonetheless an important question. And sometimes there can be great advantages to doing things that not everyone has done before. Instead of, you know, there was a period like 10 years ago when, or maybe 15 years ago now, when the thing was you've got to find a new instrument for schooling, right? And so half the papers on the job market were people who'd found these kind of crazy instruments for schooling and everybody's very excited. Now everybody's, now it's RD land, right? This was kind of three or four years ago. Half the people in the job market had RD papers. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's great. But you can do what everybody else is doing or you can, Make your own way. Now, if you go too far off on your own way, uh, no one may want to hire you or tenure you. So there's a, there's a, 
there's, this is a different problem pre-tenure than post-tenure, and the solution is not probably one extreme or the other, but there can be a real advantage to finding a topic that isn't, ground that is not already well trod, let us say. Well, I think, right, so in an education context, there's stuff that my uh, friend and former colleague, Todd Steinbrenner, Western Ontario did, right? So he went down this path of creating his own data set, the Berea panel study, right? So his dad was a provost at Berea College in Kentucky. And he and his dad, who was the Ralph Steinbrenner co-author on these papers, uh, did this big survey of these kids at Berea College, which is a really cool college because the price of going there is zero for everybody, right? So it has this gigantic endowment and it only serves poor people. And so everybody gets a free ride, everybody gets room and board, and everybody gets a little job. And so it's all these pretty disadvantaged kids and, and they survey them and because of this they can pay them very little and get really high response rates on the surveys because these kids have no money. Um, you know, one, Todd has this slide in one of his presentations and he quotes one of the students as saying, I kind of live from survey to survey. Uh, so he's got this great data. One of the things he does is sort of ask them along the way, what do you think people with this degree tend to earn in the labor market? And over time, he finds that people's understandings of the labor market compensation associated with different majors improves. That's kind of cool, right? That is a version of what I have in mind here um, that is very doable, right? Yeah, and then he, I'm a huge fan of Dodd's and because he, um, so he did his PhD at Virginia where he wrote with Steve Stern and Bill Johnson and so he got a fairly structural training at Virginia and then he came and did a postdoc at Michigan with John Bound and during the, around the time that John Bound and Charlie Brown and others were working on the PSID validation study, which was a, this exercise of trying to figure out how much measurement error there was in the PSID, where they got a large firm, one might call it General Motors, to, do, to administer the PSID survey instrument to a bunch of their employees, and then they got administrative records from the employees. And so they could compare stuff about earnings and hours and you know, what kind of insurance you have and all this kind of stuff, and get a sense of the measurement error in the PSID survey questions. Um, so Todd has this really interesting mix of, of kind of, you know, being willing to do his own survey and concerned about measurement and details of the data with always in his head the structural model. And so, you know, expectations play a very important role in structural models of behavior that happens over time. And part of what he wanted to do with his survey was to inform the structural model with actual data on what people said their expectations were, uh, which I thought was a very cool product, a very cool project. Uh, other people have done things like that more recently as well. All right, uh, I'm going to skip that question. I was actually going to call on you, so but you've already called on yourself, so that's fine. Um, what are the implications of this simple model for thinking about non-experimental evaluation strategies? So a natural first place to start is exogeneity or conditional dependence. Now these are actually different. Right, this is exogeneity, this is the version of this that will be written in the, like the Wooldridge undergraduate text, which is the one I teach out of for my undergraduate econometrics class. This is, so we have this composite error term here, right, that is composed of the time invariant component and the transitory shock component. And we need the expected value of that conditional on x and d to be zero. That allows us to causally interpret the coefficients on x's and the d, right? Now in fact, in treatment effects land, we actually usually don't care about a causal interpretation of the coefficient on the x's. Usually the x's are there as kind of a nuisance thing, right? We, we need them, we need to condition on them to make conditional dependence assumption true, but we don't actually, we're not going to interpret their coefficients causally. In that case, we can just make a conditional dependence assumption, which allows us to make a causal interpretation of the coefficient on d, but not on x. So it's a weaker assumption. So you might be willing, for example, to include lagged x's if all you care about interpreting causally is the coefficient on d, whereas you might be less concerned about, or less happy to put in lagged x's in this world because you're worried that epsilon is serially correlated and that as a result, 
uh, or leg y's, I should say, among the x's, and that as a result, the leg y will be correlated with the present epsilon if the epsilons are serially correlated. That's a problem for exogeneity, maybe less of a problem for conditional independence. And in fact, in the active labor market program literature, there's a heavy emphasis on putting in lag y's as conditioning variables, but then not interpreting them causally, because all you really care about is the coefficient on d, on the indicator for the active labor market program. There is indeed a fair amount of evidence, and if you think about it, this kind of has to be true. Suppose you were in a stationary process, which of course people are not a stationary process. They're young, then they're middle-aged, and then they're old. And, but suppose you were, if you had enough lagged Ys, you could capture eta with sort of arbitrary precision, right? Because with enough periods, you take out the effect of the Xs, the epsilons are just sort of ID transitory shocks, they average out, what you're left with is the eta. So this is the motivation for including leg Ys, but you don't really want to include leg Ys if you're going to interpret the coefficients on the Xs causally. You do want to include leg Ys if what you're interested in is just the coefficient on the Ds. See how the model helped us with choosing our identification strategy, right? We wrote down a model that has an eta in it, and we said, ah, well, if there's selection on eta, then we somehow, if we're going to do a strategy that's based on conditioning, and some of you may know I seem to be the, the two cheers for conditional independence guy in the world, uh, and I'm kind of okay with that. I have another lecture that you're not seeing today that's kind of in defense of conditional independence. Um, happy to talk about that at lunch. If we're worried that there is selection on this eta, that is to say it's more able or less able or more attractive or less attractive or more, more non-cognitive skills versus less non-cognitive skills to the extent that those are time invariant, people are selecting into D, then we need to capture eta somehow. One way to do that is to put in a lot of lagged outcomes. And indeed, the literature suggests via comparisons of estimates that attempt to difference out the eta with estimates that attempt to condition for the eta, that you don't actually need too many periods of lagged outcomes in this context to successfully deal with selection on eta. All right, blah, blah, blah. The model also embodies the standard strategy of using variations in costs as an instrumental variable, right? So think about our participation equation. Here we have direct costs. Think about any Bill Evans paper, right? So Bill Evans is my, my friend and former colleague from my Maryland days. Um, he has a very unique methodological perspective. I remember one time I met, I met Bill in the hallway at Maryland. And you know we, we said, hello. And I said, well, what are you doing today? He said, I'm looking for instruments. That's, that's kind of his lifestyle approach, right, is he goes out and looks for instruments all the time. And many of those instruments are costs. So he has this paper on the effect of prenatal care on pregnancy outcomes where the cost variation comes from a bus strike. All right, so there's a bus strike in a city for a limited period of time, but during that time, some women who would have gotten prenatal care, some low-income women, if the buses were operating, don't get prenatal care because they have no other way to get to the doctor. Right? That's variation in C. Fits right in the model. Right? You can see why that's nice to do. Um, and I foreshadowed here difference in differences. Right? If you think about the composite error term here, and if you're willing to assume that the x's sort of suffice to take care of selection on the transitory shock, but you're still worried about selection on the time invariant component, you can do differences. Right? That's one way to think about the mode of standard motivation for difference in differences. I call that identification assumption bias stability, or BSA, not Boy Scouts of America, but bias stability assumption. That's drawn from the statistics literature. I like, I'm a bit pedantic this way. I like to distinguish between identification assumptions and estimators that build on those assumptions. And the literature is often very loose about whether difference in differences is an identification assumption or an estimator. And so by giving different names, I help keep them straight in my head. So that's why I like to distinguish between conditional independence, which is an identification assumption, and matching, which is a particular estimator that is motivated by conditional independence, right? There's lots of other estimators, inverse propensity weighting, parametric linear model, 
that are also motivated by conditional independence. Right? These two things are distinct, uh, the estimator choice and the identification strategy. All right, so there's a lot in that little model. Here's some data. Yes? Oh, could we go back to your uh, assumption? I just was curious, how would you compare something like unfoundedness, which yeah. I'm a little more familiar with, to Wooldridge's exogeneity? Or so I, I can, I'm, what I'm calling conditional independence is unconfoundedness. I find, the un, I find that terminology unattractive, unpleasant to say, unconfoundedness. I mean, that's an awkward word, right? Now, it's true, you know, conditional dependence assumption has its own negative associations, perhaps, for some, but uh, when, it's, when it's the CIA. Um, but I, I, I think it's clear what that is. But yeah, that's, the literature calls those two things the same. There's also this word, uh, Strong ignorability, that's another statistics literature term. That's also what I'm calling conditional independence. Okay? Sorry. No, don't be sorry for having a question. Yeah, fixed effects. I mean, fixed effects is, is the way this be made. in a simple context, isomorphic to difference of differences. Right. In, in, yes, but that's the same idea. So, one of my favorite stories from graduate school. Uh, was there was a seminar one day, and, and back in the day, there was a seminar on Mondays that was jointly run by Gary Becker and Sherwin Rosen. And the typical paper in the seminar was a style of paper that is less common now, where there would be a kind of nice applied theory model, and then there'd be some design-based empirical work that was linked to the applied theory model by having variables with the same names. And you would test using design-based empirical work comparative static predictions from the applied theory model. Anyway, one day in the seminar, the person who was presenting, I don't remember who it was, had, was going on and on and on about their applied theory model, and it was getting to the point there were only you know, 20 minutes left in the seminar or something, and finally Sherwin Rosen said, let's look at the goddamn data. And uh, you know, I've been in many seminars since that time where I had that exact same thought, it's like let's, let's look at the data. And pardon my French. And why did we call swearing French? I don't know why that is. Anyway, here is some data. So this is from Heckman Smith, 1999, in the Economic Journal. This is data from the National Job Training Partnership Act study. We will say more about that in the second lecture. This was a large randomized controlled trial evaluation of the major US federal job training program of the 1980s and 1990s. Excuse me, so the predecessor for the Workforce Investment Act. As part of that study, and I'll tell this history in the second lecture, they included, they built in a non-experimental evaluation at four out of the 16 experimental sites. So at four of the 16 experimental sites, they not only collected data on the treatments and the controls, they collected data on eligible non-participants. Sort of an ideal comparison group. And it was nice because the same survey instrument was used for the non-experimental comparison group as was used for the experimental control group and the experimental treatment group. Right, so what have we got here? So this, these are male adults, uh, 22 and above, female adults, 22 and above. I'm going to tell you to ignore one of these lines for my purposes here today. So the little dotted line here, that is the control group from the experiment. So this is the control group for the adult females, the control group for the adult males. The line I want you to ignore is the solid line down here. That's from the SIP. Put that to the side for today. The ideal comparison group, the eligible non-participants who are in the same local labor markets and have the data measured in the same way, using the same survey instruments, they are this line up here and this line down here. All right, so the sort of long dashes. Now I want to think about the comparison between the control group, remember, not treated, right? And there's, that's not quite true, and there's a whole set of papers about that, but for the moment, control group, not treated. Uh, and the eligible non-participants, not treated. But the difference is that the control group people wanted to be treated. They're D equals one people. They went down to the JTP office and tried to get in the program but we're forced to experience the untreated outcome. So let's look at the men. What do we see? Well, the first salient feature here is this thing, this dip. 
This is called the Ashenfelter dip, because Ashenfelter was the first person to discover it in a paper about the predecessor to JTPA, actually the predecessor to the predecessor to JTPA, the Manpower Demonstration and Training Act of the 1960s, he discovered that the average earnings of program participants declined in the period prior to participation. So the period little t here is the analog of period k in the model. That is the period in which <coughs> the control group is randomly assigned and the eligible non-participants are determined to be eligible for the program. So we're thinking about that as the period, a period in which they make this choice about participating or not. Now, if you look at the micro foundations of this, to use a fine phrase from our macroeconomist friends, in fact, no individual person experiences the dip as it looks here. What individual people experience is that. They experience job loss, right? But if you average a bunch of those together, and if the rate of job loss is increasing as you get closer to period K, you get this nice, smooth aggregate dip, which is kind of cool. All right, this is, this is important. How does it fit into the model? It fits into the model that this looks like, right, and then this is the control group, but what happens to them after random assignment? On average, they bounce back to where they were. They manage to actually find employment on their own without a job training program. This looks to me like selection on Epsilon IT, right? This looks like a transitory shock, right? People experience a bad labor market outcome, they lose their job, they go to the program, they don't get in, they continue searching, and that after a few months they get back to where they were, basically, on average, on average, right? So we can think about that in terms of the model as epsilon IT, if we add a bit of serial correlation to epsilon IT, right? That's kind of cool, but that's clearly for the men not all that's going on, right? We also have this big levels difference that appears both beforehand and afterwards between the eligible non-participants and the controls. That suggests selection on eta, right? That suggests that the average eta of the eligible non-participants is substantially higher than the average eta of the controls, of the d equals one units. So the model, right, it was a pretty simple, pretty darn simple model is able to integrate these two very important features of the real data, which is that there appears to be selection on levels, sort of time invariant levels, and there appears to be selection on transitory shocks. That's kind of cool. And that also tells us something about what we have to do in terms of identification, right? If we think back to the conditional independence assumption, right, it seems to be the case that we have select, that there's correlation between epsilon and D and there's correlation between eta and d. Now, the graph I showed you didn't condition on any x's, but in the raw data, it looks like we have selection both on transitory and on time invariant components of outcomes. That's useful to know when you're thinking about choosing identification strategy. Uh, I think that's what I want to say about that. Any questions about the model before I move on a bit? Yes. Ah, you're, you're pointing out what I did not point out, and should have pointed out, that there does not seem to be a lot of selection on ADA among the adult women. Yeah. Variation in the sense that this, this is sort of gently increasing or, or just the, the, space, the big yeah. vertical difference? I think that has to do with the fact that a lot of the women who participate are on welfare, so there's a lot of zeros in there in a way that there are not a lot of zeros for the men. And so you have women on welfare who choose to participate, women on welfare who choose not to participate. They're kind of more alike in an important sense than the men who choose to participate versus the men who don't. So a lot of the men who are eligible non-participants are men who are stably employed but at low wage jobs. So those people are a bit different than the eligible non-participants on the and the, the JDPA eligibility rules let in a lot of people, right? You can work full time at the minimum wage and be eligible for JDPA. And that's what some of these folks are up here. For the women, partly because the AFDC program was encouraging them to go down and get JDPA, there's a lot more 
women on welfare whose earnings are zero. And so there's just, it's, it's, you are correct to highlight the fact that there is a substantive difference here. And it comes from features of the program environment in the United States where women, single moms, get a check, right? There's a program for them, they get a check. There is no program for single men, right, other than food stamps. That's a good question. Yes? So if there were no X variables here, or if they were the same between the treatment and the controls, would we then conclude from this that the conditional independence assumption is violated? Yes. Yeah, OK. But if you go read the papers, you will see that if you collect the right X data, and I'll say more about this in the second part of the lecture, if you collect the right X data, you can more or less solve the selection problem in, in this context with conditioning. So, I know, right? heresy, right? Descriptive study. Anyway, all right, I'm gonna, there's, there's lots of ways to do uh, random assignment, that's a good thing. Uh, experiments require assumptions, I think everybody knows that now. That was big news when, when we wrote about it in 1995, but I think it's not big news now. So I wanna go on to this part which is uh, now focusing on beta, D, beta sub di, right? So the heterogeneous treatment effects and how we might think about the heterogeneous treatment effects, right? I put them in the model. I talked about how they matter for selection. Heterogeneous treatment effects help you if they're randomly assigned, right? So in the simulation part of the Heckman, Lalonde, and Smith handbook chapter, we do this exercise where we increase the variance of randomly assigned beta di, right, of nature randomly assigns beta di. And the higher the variance of the distribution of beta di, the more selection into the treatment is driven by beta di and the less it's driven by eta i or epsilon i t, right? And so if you think that the variance of beta di is really large and that it's distributed across the population in ways that are unrelated to the untreated outcome, then nature may have given you random assignment. That's a strong claim, but it's interesting to think about. Okay, other parameters of interest. So this, is a, this part of the talk is riffing on the Heckman, Smith, and Clements 1997 restud paper. Um, the notion here is that if you think about a randomized controlled trial, what it provides you with is two marginal outcome distributions. Randomized controlled trial provides you with the marginal distribution of the treated outcome, that's what you get from the treated group, and the marginal distribution of outcomes in the untreated state, that's what you get from the control group. That's great, you can construct a lot of parameters of interest with those two marginal distributions. You can take their means and get the average effective treatment on the treated, for example, but there's a whole lot of parameters that you might be interested in that we don't talk about very much, and the reason we don't talk about them very much is that they require the joint distribution. They require this object here, f of y1, y0, rather than just the marginal distribution of, the, of y1 and the marginal distribution of y0. So suppose that you wanted to know the variance of impacts. Right? Well, to know the variance of impacts, you need to know which y1 goes with which y0. That's what the joint distribution tells you. That would be really cool to know. Right? That would be a very powerful thing to know. That would tell, and it would be cool to know how many people actually made worse off by a program, right? If there's heterogeneous treatment effects, it's quite plausible that most programs make some people better off, some people worse off. Maybe on average, they're worth doing, but still, you'd like to know if there's a bunch of losers from the program or not. You'd like to recover the entire impact distribution. You could look at percentiles of it, you could look at features of it, blah, 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 blah. But to know the distribution of impacts, which is not the effect, the impact on the distribution of outcomes. That's a different thing. But if you want to know the distribution of impacts, you have to know the joint distribution. And experiments don't give you the joint distribution. So, how to think about the joint distribution. That's what Heckman, Smith, and Clements do. And then I have a paper with my student uh, from Maryland, Habiba Jabari, that, uh, excuse me, sort of updates, uh, it's, it's partly Heckman, Smith, and Clements rewritten the way I wanted to write it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's a good use of time to rewrite old papers uh, the way you wanted to write them, but that's partly what this is. It also updates the literature, which moved 
uh, some amount between 1997 and 2008. It also applies all of the tricks from uh, Heckman, Smith, and Clements 1997 to the data from the Progressa experiment. So Heckman, Smith, and Clements uses the Job Training Partnership Act experiment. Jabari and Smith uses the Progressa experiment. So if you're into development economics, there you go. Uh, so I want to do a simple example here, which I think is fun. This is perhaps the most fun part of this lecture. And probably you haven't seen that this before. So I'm actually going to, this chalk, this is very old school. And if I were better at graphics programs, I would do this on the slides, but I'm not. But actually, I think there's some value to me for, to create it afresh each time uh, with the chalk. So I'm going to do a binary outcome to keep this simple, right? So let's say we do an experiment. It's a job training program. The outcome that we're going to measure is, are you employed 18 months after a random assignment? And we imagine that 18 months is long enough that everybody's kind of finished their training and, and had some time to look for a job in the job market. So the two outcomes are not employed and employed. We've done random assignment. So this is the treatment group. This is the control group. And we get marginal distributions. So in the control state, 40% of people are not employed, 60% of people are employed. In the treated state, so this is a remarkably effective program because it increases employment rates by 20 percentage points. I know of no such program in real life, but these numbers are convenient to work with. Uh, in the treated state, 20% of people are not employed eight months after a random assignment, 80% of people are employed. The joint distribution consists of these four cells. Right? So this cell is, I'm not employed in the treated state, I'm not employed in the control state. This cell is, I'm not employed in the treated state, I am employed in the control state. Those are the people who are made worse off by the treatment. Right? This cell is not employed in the control state, employed in the treated state. Those are the people who are made better off in terms of employment. And this cell is employed in both states. So those people are kind of fine. Treatment doesn't help them, doesn't make them worse off. What can we do? What can we do to try to get this, right? So the marginals don't give us this, right? What do the marginals give us? The marginals give us two pieces of information. Because we know always that they sum to one. So each marginal is giving us sort of one, one piece of information. How many unknowns do we have? There's four cells, but we know that their probability sum to one. So there's three unknowns. So we have two pieces of information, three unknowns. That's the problem. Right? Well, one way to solve this is to make an assumption. So one assumption that's out there in the literature, Chuck Mansky has written about this, is just assume that the program doesn't make anybody worse off. Or doesn't make anybody worse off. So done, right? If we're willing to assume, and maybe for some treatments, it's plausible that nobody would be made worse off. If we're willing to assume that, then boom, right? Then we could fill in the rest of the numbers because now we have two, two pieces of information and two unknowns. Did everybody? F that went a little fast, right? So I assume this, but now I know, right, that this row total has to be 0.2. So if this is 0, that gives me this cell. I know that this column has to be 0.4. I've got this cell that gives me this. I know that the four numbers have to sum to 1. That gives me the 0.6. But in a given context, in a given substantive context, this assumption may not be very plausible that nobody is made worse off. So what else can we do? It turns out that you can bound the joint distribution, even though you cannot point identify the joint distribution. So that's the so-called frechet hofting bounds. They're up there. I'm going to try to give you uh, the intuition for the two. This is set identification, right? So if you're an I.O. person, industrial organization person in economics, what the labor economics land calls bounds, industrial organization land calls set identification. That's why they get paid more than we do. Uh, they have better terminology. That's a gentle of the I.O. people. 
Uh, but the idea is that you don't get an exact number, but in the space of all possible joint distributions, you, some are included as being possible given the marginals, and some are excluded as being impossible given the marginals. That's what you've accomplished. That may or may not, that included set may or may not be interesting. Right? This is sort of a knock on the bounds literature in labor economics is that, you know, if you don't impose much in the way of assumptions or structure, oftentimes you don't get much out in terms of limitations on the space of possible parameter values. Uh, but let's see what we can do here. So the upper bound is pretty easy. The upper bound says that this cell can't be more than either of the two relevant marginals, right? So this cell can't have more than 0.2 because, a given, because these two cells add up to that, these two cells add up to that. So if this cell is 0.3, we've done something wrong because this row needs to add up to 0.2, right? That's what the upper bound is telling you. What about the lower bound? Well, think about the lower bound is basically keeping you from having rows and columns that go over one. Right, so if I put, um, point, let's see, right, zero point nine point three, right, so the lower bound on this cell here, right, is max of 0 and f1 of y1 plus f0 of y0. <coughs> if I get too low a number in this cell, then why am I putting that? Oh, dear. No, dear. OK. My explanation is not appealing to me. Ah, here's a better counterexample. No, that's, that's, So let's think about, all right, let's think about this cell here, right? So F1 of 1 is 0.6, F, or pardon me, is 0.8, F0 is 0.6, minus 1, that's 0.4, and the max of 0.4 at 0 is 0.4, and so this has to be at least 0.4. If we make it 0.2, then we have a problem, right? Because now these add up to 1.2, and I haven't even considered this one, right? So what the lower bound is doing is it's forcing me to put at least 0.4 of the probability in here, because if I don't put at least 0.4 of the probability in here, then these three are gonna add up to more than one, and I'm gonna be sad. Right? So that's the intuition behind the other bound. I apologize for the stumbling. So, Let's think about the two extreme cases exemplified by the upper and lower bounds. So if I put 0.4 there, and that's 0 0.2, 0 0.4, that's zero. If I put 0.2 here, and that's 0.6, Four, that's point two, and that's point two, right? No, that's not right. Let's go with that. Okay. So there's two bounding distributions. I apologize for this 
slight confusion. This is the same. This bounding distribution minimizes the amount of probability mass in the off-diagonal cells. This bounding distribution maximizes the amount of probability mass in the off-diagonal cells. Both are consistent with the given marginals. All right, let's think about the worlds that are associated with these two joint distributions. All right, this gives us a sense of, again, this is the included set, the set of joint distributions that are consistent with the given marginals. In this world, nobody is made worse off by the program. 20% of people are made better off. 80% of people have the same outcome in both the treated and untreated states. So this is kind of a very modest world. This is sort of a, a program that helps some people, has no effect on most people, doesn't make anybody worse off. In this world, right, 40% of people are made better off, but 20% of people are made worse off. This is a world with much more treatment effect heterogeneity in this world, right? So here, 80% beta di is equal to 0, 20% beta di is equal to 1, right? They, their employment status is positive. Here, 40% of people beta di is equal to 0, 20% beta di is minus 1, and 40% beta di is equal to 1. Same marginals, different joints, pretty different worlds, right? I think we would think a bit differently about this world than we would about this world. I think in general, most people, well, most people tend to think in terms of common effects. But if you think about it a little bit, right, we know that in this experiment, there have to be heterogeneous treatment effects because it's a binary outcome and the difference in the employment probability is 0.2, right? So it can't, it can't be that everybody's binary outcome goes up by 0.2 because it's a binary outcome. So we know there have to be treatment effects. I remember there was a day when I was sitting in the basement of Newark. Uh, we, our offices used to be in the basement of the 1155 building before all this awe-inspiring uh, improvement occurred over here and the economics department moved into Sae Hall. And I was thinking, you know, if you think about earnings as an outcome and you observe that in the control group, there's a whole bunch of people with zero earnings, there have to be heterogeneous treatment effects, right? If the, if the average impact of the program is not zero, earnings are bounded below at zero, and there's a bunch of people in the control group who have zero, right? Then they either have to have been made worse off or they have to have gone from zero to zero while, while some other people went up. And so just from that fact, from the fact that a bunch of people in the control group have zero earnings, but the mean impact is positive, you know the treatment effect isn't homogeneous. And yet we always talk and act, again, less true now, more true 10 years ago, more true in literatures outside of labor, like there is this common treatment effect. And that's just wrong, almost always. Yes? We don't know that they're worse, in the, in the example of the earnings, we don't know that some people are worse off, but we know that there at least must be some people with no impact who went from zero to zero, right? So suppose in JDPA, the mean impact on the earnings of adult women is 800, but 20% of the adult women in the control group, or pardon me, in the treatment group, I should say, have earnings of zero, right? So, and earnings are bounded from below at zero. Pardon me? Well, that's their outcome. That's their Y1, right? They did the program. They got randomly assigned to the treatment group. In the 18 months after random assignment, they had zero earnings. Okay? But the mean earnings difference between the treatment group and the control group is 800. So on average, earnings are, the distribution of earnings is moving to the right. If there were a common treatment effect, if everybody's impact was 800, then what you would see is that the whole distribution of earnings would move over by 800. But if the whole distribution of earnings moved over by 800, there'd be no people in the treatment group with earnings of zero. Because zero is the lowest value of earnings, right? To get, to move the distribution by 800 and have there be people at zero, there had to be people at minus 800 before. And there aren't any people with negative earnings. That influences our conclusion about the program because it says there have to be heterogeneous treatment effects, right? Which, 
is not a direct conclusion about the program in the substantive sense of should we keep it or should we let it go, but in thinking about programs, a world where the effects of programs are very heterogeneous is a very different policy world than a world where the effects of programs are the same on every person who participates in them. Right? So if the program is leaving some folks behind, then that says, perhaps, well, wouldn't it be good if we could figure out ex ante who's going to benefit more from the program and who is not? Right? If we know now for sure that there are heterogeneous treatment effects because we observe that the treatment does not move the distribution of earnings over by a constant amount. So we know there's heterogeneous treatment effects. What it does is there's still this big mass point at zero, but it kind of spreads out the tail. But remember, we're doing a randomized controlled trial here. So everybody is experiencing the same aggregate economy. And we're assuming away for the moment, as I think it's reasonable in the JTPA case for this purpose, we're assuming away equilibrium effects, right? Because the JTPA program is a very small part of the labor market, even in these, four, even in these uh, 16 sites. And so maybe there are some very marginal spillover effects from the treated units to the untreated units, but they're probably very small. I think we can put them to the side. So they're experiencing the same aggregate conditions. That's the beauty of a randomized trial, right? We take people in the same place who applied to the same program, and we randomly force some of them to experience the untreated outcome. So that's not the issue, right? But if, suppose the distribution of earnings looks like, uh, so this is zero, it's a big mass point, and then it kind of looks like that for, uh, the treatment group in the experiment, and suppose for the control group, it also has a somewhat bigger mass point at zero, and kind of this, a bit less of a tail. Right, if that's the picture, right, so this is f of y1, this is f of y0. In a, in a common effect world, what would happen is that we would take the control distribution and we would just shift it over by the common effect. Right? Well, that is not what you see. And the fact that you don't see that, and it's, and it's easiest to see with the zeros, right? So in the control distribution for the adult women, about 20% of the women have zero earnings in the 18, 23% have zero earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. In the treated distribution, about 20% have zero earnings in 18 months after random assignment. But if everyone was getting this common effect of 800, then there should be a mass point at 800 that corresponds to 23% of the people, and there's not, right? The program moves, right? We'll talk about rank preservation in a second, but in a loose sense, the program is moving a few people away from zero, but it's not moving everybody away from zero. So it has to be having heterogeneous effects. If it had a common effect, then this distribution would just move over by the common effect, right? Because everybody's earnings would be their earnings in the untreated state, Y0, plus the common effect, plus beta D with no I subscript. And that is not what we observe. And that's kind of cool. I know, I'm not sure if this is, is obscure or, or, or if you're thinking, gee, that's really trivial. It, it is trivial at some level, right, to say that programs have heterogeneous effects until you go and read the literature and you realize that almost all the time people talk about pre programs, and not just active labor market programs, but sort of every program that's out there, as if they had the, the effect on everybody. And it's not. There's heterogeneity. I've never, yeah. That was one of the lessons I took away from this exercise in grad school was this is really first order important, uh, that there is heterogeneous, there are heterogeneous treatment effects of programs, and that means that figuring out, if we can, figuring out ways to determine ex ante who is going to have a positive effect and who is not could be really socially useful, right? Think about this in the context of colleges, right? So in that literature, in the literature on post-secondary education in the U.S., there's a lot of hand-wringing, quite reasonably, about the fact that a large fraction of people who start four-year degree programs never finish. Now, you can think about that in a bunch of different ways. One way to think about that is that a lot of people are 
start four-year degree programs. They don't know what their beta DI is. And as they progress through college, they learn more about their beta DI. And they determine that their beta DI is negative. And so they drop out. Now, that's not the only thing that's going on with dropout. There's credit constraint issues, potentially, and lots of other things. But probably some of it is this sort of notion. So Mansky has this paper about uh, sort of the experimentation aspect of post-secondary education, right? That if people are uncertain about their treatment effect of post-secondary education, then the optimal dropout rate isn't zero, because you want people to be learning. And some people are going to learn, you know, I shouldn't do this. This is not for me. Uh, at the same time, four-year education is expensive, right? I mean, we subsidize it in the U.S. at public universities, so the fact that it's expensive isn't as visible to the taxpayer, but it costs tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars a year to have an undergraduate attend a four-year college program. If we could figure out ex ante just a bit better that 10% of the students who start these programs are going to conclude after a year or two that their beta DI is negative and not have them do it at all. The social, research, social resource savings would be huge, right? And they'd be better off too because they would go immediately into the labor market and start building up experience, right? Instead of spending a year or two learning that their beta DI from college is negative. So once you start to think in terms of heterogeneous treatment effects, right, it has, not only does it have kind of a conceptual effect on the way that you think about uh, program design and operation, but it has a direct policy implication that says, you know, if we could figure out who's going to benefit from this program and who is not and sort them accordingly, we could potentially experience a huge efficiency gain. Um, if, all you, if you're ever only thinking about beta D as not having a subscript, that never occurs to you and it's not a problem, right? If the treatment has the same effect on it, everybody, it doesn't matter. You don't worry about it. Yes? I think I lost the notation a little. So uh -oh. D equals one as the treatment indicator. Yes. And then R is whether you're randomized into uh, So this, oh, yeah, that's bad. That should be that. Is that better? OK, so D says I D says, says I wanted to be in the program. I showed up and got randomly assigned. Okay. These folks were randomly assigned to the treatment group. These folks were randomly assigned to the control group. Yes? Uh, you're asking the wrong guy, because I think all programs have heterogeneous effects. But uh, tell me what motivates your, do you have a candidate? Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, so there's treatment effect heterogeneity. I agree that that's fine. No, but it should determine how we think about programs and how we think about the results of evaluations of programs, right? So think back to my marriage example, right? If, if you think that there's a common effect of marriage, then when you read the literature and you see that there's positive impacts on earnings and positive impacts on health and positive impacts on this and that, among the married, right, because that whole literature is about estimating the effect of marriage on the married, if you think you're in a common effect world, you say, well, come on, we've got to subsidize marriage. We've got to get everybody married because this is great. If you think that there's a lot of treatment effect heterogeneity in marriage and that people have some idea of what their treatment effect is and are sorting accordingly, then the effect at the, of, and then let's suppose we decide to subsidize marriage, well, then we're going to attract in some marginal people Right, whose beliefs about their treatment effect of marriage are, you know, put them on the margin. They sort of think, okay, given the present subsidy, I'm kind of indifferent, but now with this bigger subsidy, I'm going to sort into marriage. But their treatment effect is not going to be the average because their guy's on the margin. It's going to be less than that, but positive. So the effect of this subsidy, right, in a heterogeneous treatment effect world, we bring in the people who have small but not awful treatment effects from marriage. There, so let's think about, uh, da, 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 da. I love these things.
proposed that the treatment effective marriage has a uniform distribution. Uh, and on some metric, it goes from 10 to minus 10. All right? And if we leave marriage completely alone, then what happens is that these folks get married, the ones who have positive treatment effects, and, and they, everybody knows their treatment effect exactly, and these folks do not get married, right? And so we go out and we do our study, and we estimate the average treatment effect on the treated of marriage, and it's five, right? Because we have a uniform distribution from zero to 10 among the married. Now, if we're Waite and Gallagher, we say, aha, the treatment effect of marriage is five. All these people are missing out on five. So we need to induce them somehow to get married so that they will experience the treatment effect of five. If we think about this in terms of heterogeneous treatment effects, then we say, ah, for the marginal married person, the treatment effect is epsilon. Right? They're just a little bit better than indifferent. And so what happens if we then say, ah, We've read this book, we know that the treatment effect of marriage is five, and so we want to subsidize marriage. So we're gonna, we're gonna give a subsidy of, let's say, two to all married people through the tax system. Then what's gonna happen? What's gonna, if people believe that this subsidy is gonna last forever, blah, 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 then what's gonna happen is that our new subsidy policy is gonna cause all those folks to get married. Because even though their treatment effect from marriage per se is negative, it's only a little bit negative, and so the subsidy is sufficient to cancel out the small negative effect of marriage and cause them to get married. But these folks, right, the average treatment effect among these marginal people who are induced into marriage by our subsidy policy is minus one, right? It's not five. So thinking about this in terms of a homogeneous treatment effect, where everybody gets five and why are all those stupid people not getting married to get their five, versus thinking about it in terms of heterogeneous treatment effects, gives you a very different perspective, right? The subsidy sounds great in the world where everybody gets five. The subsidy doesn't sound so great in the world where we're attracting in to marriage people who actually have a negative treatment effect of marriage, but are willing to suck it up because of the subsidy, yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Because I wanted to say, you know, maybe an example of this is saying that we should use charter schools for all students. And I think that there are some very clear reasons why we should do that. I want to do that. But this isn't quite the same thing, right? But it's related. It's related, yeah. It's I mean, there's two issues in your example, right? One is just charter schools per se, right? People select into charters in most of the institutional environments in which they're set up with. And the people who select in may be people whose treatment effects of charters are on average higher, right? The second issue that you raise ha is a narrow issue that has to do with this particular design that people use of using the lotteries from the oversubscribed charter schools, right? That's a separate but related issue about how we can generalize even from the set of students who participate in a lottery for a charter school to the set of all students who attend a charter school because some charter schools are not oversubscribed and don't have lotteries, right? That's, that's a distinct issue relative to just the, oh, charter schools are like marriage and maybe the people who select into charter schools, we would expect the simplest economic model you write down, right, the one I wrote down, suggests that they should have higher average treatment effects than the ones who don't sort in. Now, let me offer a caveat to that and then we'll take a break. So, You know this guy, right, Eric Chin. Uh, he's a student from Michigan whose committee I was on. Very clever guy, got a job at Virginia. Uh, he has this really cool paper. 
And, and it's very appropriate, since we're in Chicago, to talk about it, because it's a paper about Chicago public housing. And the idea of this paper is that he wants to look at the effect of living in uh, big, old-school, high-rise public housing complexes on later life outcomes. Right? And the way he gets exogenous variation is that oftentimes these, these complexes would have, say, eight buildings. So let's, let's say this is Robert Taylor Homes, which was, I believe, the one over by uh, the Dan Ryan Expressway. And let's say there were eight buildings, or actually more. When they got it into their heads to tear down these high rises, the order in which they tore down the high rises for many of the complexes was arguably random. That one of the buildings would have a pipe burst that was going to be really expensive to repair. And so they said, we're just going to tear that one down first. Gives me. And so what Eric does is essentially these people all get displaced, right? They say, we're going to tear the building down. Everybody who lives in this building is handed a voucher, a Section 8 housing voucher that allows them to go get a subsidized apartment in the private market somewhere else. All these people remain, usually for several more years. And so he compares the outcome of these folks who are moved into not high-rise public housing via this voucher system to these folks using administrative data. And what he finds is effects on earnings. That being removed out of the high rise when you are a young person increases your earnings as an adult. And you say, wait, wait a minute. Didn't we do a randomized trial about this? We did do a randomized trial about this. It was called Moving to Opportunity. And it was done in three sites, Chicago, Boston, and somewhere else. I don't remember where the other one was. And the signature finding of Moving to Opportunity was no effect on adult outcomes other a little bit than some psychological outcomes. How do we reconcile Eric's non-experimental but compelling results with MTO's experimental results? One solution is to throw out Eric's to say, ah, experiment's always better. Something I did not realize, though, which Eric uncovered in a course of trying to address seminar comments about why do you get different results than MTO, was that MTO, which is typical of experiments, was voluntary, right? So the people who were doing MTO went around to public housing residents and said, would you like to be in this experiment where we're going to randomly hand people vouchers? A surprisingly large fraction of people said, no, I would not like to be in that experiment. And, but some people said yes, and then the, you know, those people who said yes were randomly assigned. And, uh, to either get the voucher or not. And it's those people, right, the volunteers, whose impact is zero. Here, there's no volunteering. Building's coming down. Everybody gets a voucher. And so the reconciliation here that Eric ultimately makes in his paper is the so-called reverse Roy model. And so I guess this, you're going to get a whole lot of Roy model this afternoon from Chris. Um, what seems to be the case in the public housing context is that the people who are willing to volunteer for an experiment are the people whose treatment effects of the vouchers are small or zero, whereas the people who are not willing to volunteer for the experiment are the ones who actually benefit from being removed from the high rise. That's kind of cool. And that is, but that is not the standard model I put up of participation in the active labor market program, right? It's, uh, it's a very different model, but it's a cool model. And you can tell stories about, well, you know, if there are certain families that are, that are sort of less kind of well-functioning than others among public housing residents, and if more well-functioning ones are able to get into, are willing to be in this experiment and kind of realize that they want to be in the experiment. But what's really good but the thing that the voucher really helps is the children in the less functioning families, right? Precisely because they're in less functioning family environments, it's better for them to be away from the high rises. That's the kind of story you can tell to, recon to reconcile these results. So my point in telling this little story about Eric's paper, both to highlight it because you should read it because it's cool, but also to make the point that the simple model of heterogeneous treatment effects that I was talking about here in the context of marriage 
isn't the only possible model of how people who have some idea of their treatment effect might select into a program. That you could have contexts where you end up with people selecting into the program who have the smaller treatment effects rather than the larger treatment effects. It's going to be a context dependent thing. Yes? So, on your point about uh, using heterogeneous treatment effects to improve public policy, so yesterday I presented a paper of mine uh, on uh, removing low income kids from welfare when they turn 18 and then looking at their long term labor market outcomes. Yeah. And I find substantial heterogeneity but really no heterogeneity on the observables that we collect on these kids today. So it's like 10% of the kids earn at self-sufficiency wages, and then 90% of the kids do very poorly in the market. Mm -hmm. There are very few observables that, that predict who the, who the successful kids are going to be. So other than collecting more observables on these kids, um, do you have any thoughts about how we use the fact that the, the treatment effect is heterogeneous? Uh, I'm a big fan of collecting more observables, uh, observing more, observing, actually observing more of the observables. Uh, I think this is a frontier that is also a bit unexplored. And I'm, well, I've gone way too slowly. Uh, there is a slide, which we probably will not get to, that says, gee, it would be great if we had more theoretical models of subgroup effects. Right? So I've actually been, been kind of on the lookout for papers that formally discuss in some way or formally motivate uh, why treatment effects might be different as a function of observed characteristics. Right? So every evaluation of active labor market programs pretty much presents separate effects by men and women. But you will look long and hard and not be very successful at finding discussions of why would we why we would expect the effects of the program to be different for men and women. Right? We just kind of do it because whatever. Uh, it's the thing that you do. And, um, and there is some early program evidence where the, the actual impacts are different, but we don't really know why. And so I think there's room for thinking harder about what variables we want to measure to use in a sort of statistical treatment rule kind of context, to use in a formal system that's attempting to predict who is going to have a big impact and who is not, because I agree with you. If you look at the stuff that I did with Dan on the worker profiling and reemployment services system, which is the program in the US that, that uses a prediction uh, of outcome levels to determine who is forced to receive reemployment services early on in their spell of unemployment insurance receipt. So this is, and this is something the Europeans have taken on with, with great enthusiasm, these sorts of statistical prediction rules. So basically they have a model that's, you know, y0 is f of things that are in the administrative data at the time you show up for the start of your unemployment insurance spell. Somebody in your state has estimated this model using data now probably from 15 years ago. And you start your spell of unemployment insurance, they plug your x's into the estimated model, they get out a y0 hat. And if y0 hat is high, you are forced to receive reemployment services early in your spell of unemployment re insurance receipt. If y0 hat is low, you are not so forced. We have, Dan and I have papers, so this is, uh, Blacksmith, Berger, Noel, uh, 2003 AR. Um, where we take advantage of uh, an interesting randomized trial in Kentucky that was built in at our request. And we can look at how the treatment effect varies with Y0 hat. And the treatment effect does not appear to vary in any systematic way with Y0 hat. Although the people at the Department of Labor believe that it varies in a systematic way with Y0 hat. They believe that the treatment effect that Y1 minus Y0 is negatively correlated with, well, it depends how you measure y0. They think that the people who are predicted to do the worst without the treatment have the biggest treatment effect. And that doesn't seem to be true in the data. Right? Uh, what seems to be true in the data, and we don't have a giant sample, is that it's hard to predict, as you say, with the available x variables, who's going to have a big treatment effect and who is not. Uh, that certainly means that we can't implement a credible efficiency enhancing statistical treatment rule now, 
But I would not dismiss out of hand this idea that maybe we ought to think harder about, well, what, what things might, right? Where, where does treatment affect heterogeneity come from, and can we measure the factors that lead to it? I think that's a, a really underexploited research agenda for not just economists, but social scientists in general. Does that? Let's, uh, Aaron, no, go ahead, let's, while we're on topic. It just seems like, um, depending on how many observables you have, wouldn't it be possible to maybe do some sort of a factor decomposition approach where you're trying to get combinations of observables and see if those combinations explain some of this heterogeneity? But I guess like that's why if you have some observable pools, even if on their own they're not giving you any information, mm -hmm. you have some specific combination signal. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you were familiar with approaches like this or I mean essentially you're just adding some structure to the treatment effect, right? By See, now, what I heard was not adding structure. What I heard was, was hammer at the data with big data stuff. Right, right go, go on a fishing expedition for interaction terms with the treatment effect that matter, possibly in the context of, of producing interaction effects between indices of the x's rather than just individual x's. Right, and I guess, I mean, I agree. This is certainly a, a statistical, like, hammer the data approach. Yeah. Right? But, if you have, in the absence of a prior about what should lead to the heterogeneity, particularly in the application of a policy, wouldn't it maybe be helpful to at least get an idea through a statistical approach? No, you could think, to use the jargon of IES land, the Institute for Education Sciences land, uh, you could think of this as an exploratory rather than confirmatory exercise, right? So an exercise where you're going to go fishing and you're going to try not to get too carried away about the fish until you then do a subsequent study where you don't do fishing, where you just test out the fish. Uh, I'm fine with that. I would also mention that my friend, who I mentioned once before, uh, Herr Professor Dr. Mikhail Lechner at the University of St. Gallen, who um, has a, had a big intellectual effect on me, he and one of his students are doing kind of let's use big data stuff to try to figure out the treatment effect heterogeneity as we speak. So I was at this uh, European summer school of labor economics in May, and uh, his student was there, and that's what they were kind of doing. So let's take a break. Yeah, so I'm, I'm even more behind than usual. So uh, I'm going to do a couple more kind of highlights from the lecture one slides, and then we'll switch over to the lecture two slides, because uh, I think that stuff is fun too, and it's, it's fresh in my mind, because the, the paper just got published like two weeks ago uh, that is kind of culminates the second lecture. OK, so we've been talking about, or I've been ranting about, depending on your view, uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. One minor econometric point that is worth noting is that it's, a slight, it's slightly tricky, but not that tricky, to do a formal test of treatment effect heterogeneity if you have data from a randomized controlled trial or if you have non-experimental data that you have successfully beaten on enough that you think you are approximating a randomized controlled trial, right? So think about the randomized control trial case. In the analog of the freshet hofting bounds for continuous variables, right? the formulae are the same, but the intuition is a little bit different, is that if we, here we go. If we think about taking a continuous outcome, so let's think now about earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. And we take the treatment group, and again, I'm assuming full compliance. We could have a whole other lecture on compliance, but we're not going to do that. Take the treatment group outcomes and arrange them in order. Take the control group outcomes and arrange them in order, and assume for the moment that there's exactly the same number of people in the treatment group and the control group. You can, you can deal with it that there's not, but it's easier for the intuition to imagine that there are. Then one of the freshet hofting bounds corresponds to lining up the two distributions with a rank correlation of one. 
So you assume that the counterfactual for the top outcome and the treated outcome distribution is the top outcome and the control distribution, the counterfactual for the worst outcome and the treated outcome distribution is the worst outcome and the control outcome distribution, the median to the median, the 35th percentile, the 35th percentile, the 85th percentile, the 85th percentile, and so on, right? This is kind of like a one factor model of life, right? You have your position in the hierarchy, but what the treatment does is it moves the earnings values or the outcome values associated with the positions in the hierarchy around a little bit. <coughs> that is one bounding, that is one of the two fresh hofting bounding distributions. The other, perhaps not surprisingly, is the case where you invert the control group outcome distribution and then line them up. So that the best treated outcome goes with the worst control outcome, the best control outcome goes with the worst treated outcome, and so on. You can show formally, and it's shown in the statistics literature, that certain classes of parameters are also bounded at these two bounding distributions. And for our purposes here, the most interesting one of those is the variance of the impacts. So the variance of the impacts, not surprisingly if you think about it, is minimized when you have a rank correlation of one, and it's maximized when you have a rank correlation of minus one. And think about the intuition here. Think about the rank correlation of minus one. You're putting the best treated outcome with the worst control outcome. So that unit is going to have a really big impact. You're putting the best control outcome with the worst treated outcome. That unit's going to have a really big negative impact. On down the line, right? As you kind of go into the center where the impacts may be small. On the other hand, if you line everybody up with the rank correlation of one, then you know, you're comparing the highest to the highest, the lowest to the lowest, the middle to the middle. Those can be different. In general, they will. But they're not going to be super duper different. So that's kind of interesting. So you can bound the variance of the impacts by computing the variance of the impacts under the assumption that the rank correlation and the outcomes is plus 1, and under the assumption that the rank correlation and the outcomes is minus 1. Question is, Will those bounds be informative? The answer depends on doing a statistical test, and that's what I want to talk about for just a second. So in Appendix E of Heckman, Simpson, and Clements, anybody else would have written this up as a separate paper, and probably we should have. But in Appendix E of Heckman, Smith, and Clements, we talk about how to do this. So suppose you want to test the null hypothesis that the variance of the impacts is zero. Right? To me, this is a really interesting null. Right? As I've tried to argue, if you read the literature closely in many domains and in many time periods, people have in their heads a common effect model. Common effect model, as I've argued, has important implications for policy. If we can test the common effect model and reject the null of the common effect model, that is compelling evidence that we need to pay attention to heterogeneous treatment effects. Now, of course, magnitudes matter as well as stars. If I have a zillion observations and I reject the null that the variance of the impacts is zero, but in fact my point estimate for the variance of the impacts in the rank correlation of one context is substantively trivial, then maybe I still don't get too excited. But if the point estimate is pretty big and I can reject the null that it's zero, then I may get a bit more excited. So in Appendix E we go through and talk about how to do the test. Why is this problematic and a bit interesting from an applied econometric standpoint? Think about data, right? So take the JTPA data. That's what we did. You've got the treatment group outcome distribution. You've got the control group outcome distribution. You estimate the variance of the treatment effects by lining the two up and taking differences, right, under a rank correlation of plus 1. That's the exercise that we do. That gives you a bunch of non-zero numbers. And then you take the variance of those non-zero numbers, and that variance is... Uh, not zero. Now consider the world of the null, where the true variance of the treatment effects is zero, and consider the exercise I just described. Right? You're sampling from the treated outcome distribution. You're sampling from the untreated outcome distribution. You're estimating the variance of the impacts by taking differences in the percentiles of these two outcome distributions. Right? Those are you know, we have taken random samples, and so even under the null that the true distribution of impacts is just a point mass, 
in any given sample, our estimate of the variance of the impacts is not going to be zero. It's going to be positive. Right? Variances have to be positive. That's, that's the fundamental thing that's driving this complication here. And so what you need to do is you need to figure out, well, what's the distribution going to look like, the sampling distribution of this particular statistic, namely the estimated variance, going to look like under the null? And then we want to compare our estimate to the distribution under the null. And the way that we do that is actually not very hard, once you think about it. It's we, we just use the controls, right? So if we use the controls and then a random, sub, a random resampling of the controls, and we do that over and over again, that gives us an approximation to the distribution of the variance of impacts under the null because none of the controls get treated. And so we know if we compare controls to resampled controls that the null holds, right? Nobody is treated. And so the distribution of treatment effects is a point mass at zero. That gives us the distribution under the null. We just take random samples from the control group of the same size. For each one, we calculate uh, an estimated variance of the, tre of the treatment effect. But since we're comparing controls to controls, we know that the true treatment effect is zero for everybody. And then we look at where in that generated sampling distribution under the null, the actual variance estimate that we construct using the treatment group and the control group lies. And for the adult women in the JTPA study, it lies way out in the tail. And so we can reject the null for the adult women in the JTPA study that the variance of the impacts is zero, and we have a point estimate that is substantively large and meaningful. What surprises me, what I thought in my naivete, in my youth, was, oh, wow, this is great. Every experimental study is going to do this from here on out. Uh, well, no. Uh, it, it, I don't know of any that have actually done it. Maybe there's a couple. Uh, I think that's too bad. Now, part of this is I want to build up this body of evidence where in study after study and domain after domain, we have formally tested the null of a common effect model and rejected it, because I think that's what you will find. Uh, other people, I guess, don't share my enthusiasm for that empirical agenda, but I offer it up to you as, as something worth doing. Quantile treatment effects are related to this. Uh, so quantile treatment effects go back, I don't know if I have a site on here, I don't think I do. Uh, we do not um, cite this in Heckman, Simmons, and Clements because we didn't know about the reference. But it turns out there is an older paper by a guy called Roger Conker at the University of Illinois that actually is the first paper that, in the interim, I've been able to find that looks at quantile treatment effects. Quantile treatment effects are treatment effects that compare quantiles of the treated and untreated outcome distribution. So you think about that exercise that I just talked about of lining up the treated units and then differencing across Right? So assuming a rank preservation of one and differencing across, that gives you the quantile treatment effects. Right? So you take the difference between, say, the median of the control group distribution and the median of the treatment group outcome distribution. That is the quantile treatment effect for the median. People have started to do this, which I think is useful. But the thing that sometimes trips people up is the interpretation. So I want to say a little bit about that. and also show you some actual numbers. Uh, and then I will conclude by saying, why doesn't everybody do these? Which again is a puzzle for me, just like it's a puzzle why everybody doesn't test the null of the common treatment effect. OK, what's the interpretational issue here? The interpretational issue has to do with whether you think about the quantile treatment effects as being treatment effects at a quantile or on a quantile. Now I recognize, and this is I always, I always flinch a bit when I do this in front of foreign audiences because it's all about two prepositions in English. 
and I know that like my one foreign language I know of it is German and, and it's those little common words that have 15 different meanings that you always kind of mess up on. And so I worry about saying, oh, it's all about at versus on. But let me try to explain what I mean. One can interpret quantile treatment effects in two ways. You can just say, OK, we're kind of interested in not just the effect of the treatment on the mean, but on other features of the marginal distribution. And quantile treatment effects are a way of describing the effect of a treatment on the quantiles of the outcome distribution. So maybe it moves the median up, but it doesn't move the 75th percentile up very much. We can talk about effects on equality within the set of people who were subject to the treatment, for example, but just using these marginal distributions and looking at the quantiles. That's all very interesting and fine. That's what I mean by impacts on quantiles. We can also talk about impacts at quantiles. But to do that, we need to make an assumption about the rank correlation, about the joint distribution. This gets back to the stuff we were talking about before the break. If we are willing to assume a rank correlation of 1, which is what the literature calls, has kind of settled on calling rank preservation, <coughs> then we can interpret the quantile treatment effects as treatment effects on units at particular places in the distribution. Right? Under rank preservation, when we compare the median, so y150 and y050, 50th percentile, in my notation, under rank preservation, that's the treatment effect for people who are at the median of the outcome distribution. Because under rank preservation, the one is the counterfactual of the other. If we don't assume rank preservation, then we're just talking about effects on the shape of the distribution, but we're not making any claims about people sticking around at the same percentile in the treated state that they would have been in in a control state. That's the difference, right? When impacts on quantiles, we're not saying anything about the joint distribution, right? If I say, well, the quantile treatment effect at the median is 14, if I don't make any assumption about the joint distribution, that does not imply that any individual's treatment effect is 14. It just implies that the difference in the medians between those two outcome distributions is 14. There may be completely different people at the median in the treated outcome distribution than the control outcome distribution. That's a much weaker claim, more defensible, right? Fewer assumptions. But if you're willing to assume rank preservation, and to my mind, rank preservation is a claim for which you can make a case, right? It may not be a slam dunk case. You can't prove rank preservation. But you can argue from features of the institutional environment that rank preservation may be more or less plausible in a given substantive context. You can also do a test. So the test is in this Bittler, Gelbach, and Hoynes working paper. So Bittler, Gelbach, and Hoynes is this Marion Bittler who's at um, Davis, Jonah Gelbach, my former colleague at Maryland, who's now become a law school professor, and Hillary Hoynes at Berkeley Policy. They have a whole series of very nice papers on heterogeneous treatment effects that I quite like and recommend. So they pointed out in this, in this working paper, and it was one of these moments. I don't know if any of you have had these moments. But I had these moments where you see an idea, and you think, crap, I could have written that paper. Right? That idea is so friggin' obvious, and yet nobody had written it down. So their idea was, this was very frustrating to me when I read this paper, that you can test an implication of rank preservation by comparing the x's of people at different quantiles of the treated and untreated outcome distributions. Right? So under rank preservation, the characteristics, the observed characteristics of people at the median in the treated distribution should look like the characteristics of people at the median in the control distribution. If they don't, then rank preservation doesn't hold. If they do, rank preservation doesn't have to hold, but you haven't produced evidence against it when you could have, right? which is a funny sort of notion. So that's the test they lay out in this working paper version of the paper. The published version of the paper doesn't have the test because the editor didn't think it was interesting. So sometimes editors get things wrong. I don't know who the editor is. Some, someday I'll probably end up making that statement in a room with the editor in it. But they can come up and out themselves if they want. Uh, so under rank preservation, 
right? Quantile treatment effects are impacts at, at quantiles, right? So it's the impact on the person at the median or the unit of the median. Absent rank preservation is just the impact on the median, whatever that might be, making no assumption about the joint distribution. I think there's context where rank preservation is somewhat plausible, and I like the notion of doing these tests. Let me give you an empirical example. So this is, again, data from the adult women from the National Job Training Partnership Act evaluation. This is uh, a page from Heckman, Smith, and Clements, 1997. What we have here, where did I leave? There it is, the pointer. So here are percentiles of the outcome distribution. This is earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. Recall that the average impact for this group is about 800 on earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. I want to highlight three features of the, of the quantile treatment effects here. First of all, the quantile treatment effect from the first through the 20th percentile of the outcome distribution is zero. Why is that? I told you before. The reason is that 20% of the people in both the control group and the treatment group have zero earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. So all these zeros here are from zero minus zero equals zero. Then there's a range from about the 20th percentile to about the 90th percentile where the quantile treatment effect is about 800. And actually, we were quite stunned when we first produced this graph by the extent to which a substantial, if we, if we adopt the rank preservation assumption, a substantial fraction of the people here are essentially getting the average treatment effect as their effective treatment. All right, this is not as true for the other demographic groups, but for the adult women, the mean is about 800. <coughs> You know, 70, 80%, 70 of the adult women under rank preservation are getting treatment effects of about 800. And then there's this blip up at the high end. So we can think about this as treatment effects on. That's kind of interesting, right? It, it is for a large proportion of the distribution, it's just moving it over by 800, right? The people for whom it's not are the people who are not employed in either world. And another one of the Bittler, Gelback, and Hoynes papers actually kind of goes through a model where you have heterogeneous treatment effects plus a point mass, or homogeneous treatment effects plus a point mass at zero for the outcomes to try to capture this kind of case. The other thing I want to say about this is that the test that we propose in Appendix E for um, of the null of homogeneous treatment effects is also a test that all the quantile treatment effects are the same. Right? And so we didn't realize it at the time when we wrote that paper, but we could have framed the test that we were doing or thought about it in terms of testing restrictions across quantile treatment effects estimated in a regression framework. That's not how we were thinking about it. But if you wanted to do the test in Stata and not have to worry about the procedure that I described for estimating the distribution under the null and so on, you can just have, you can just stack 100 QREGs, right, in Stata, 100 quantile regressions for 100 different percentiles, and then do a test of the null that the coefficient on the treatment indicator is the same in every one of those regressions. That is also a test of homogeneous treatment effects. That you can do in Stata without any hard programming. So there you go. It's even more inexplicable that people don't always do this. Um, any questions about quantile treatment effects? Underused, in my view. How many people are willing to make this rank preservation assumption, would you say? So I've definitely heard the first interpretation that you taught. Uh, but that comes with caveats of what you can yeah. The second way, I can see why this is appealing, but I distrust it a little bit. Although the test you give... I, I, will, I will tease one of my students here, but I think it is symptomatic of a, of a general pattern in the literature. So there's a paper on the quantile treatment effects of college quality by my student Mike Lovenheim and a couple other former Michigan students, uh, which is in general a very nice paper using the Texas data. But they say at a couple points, 
they assure you at the beginning, and I think again at the end, that they are not assuming rank preservation. But then every discussion in between is written as though rank preservation holds. Um, that's the most common pattern in the literature, I think, is that to the extent that people pay any attention to the rank preservation issue at all, they say, oh, we're not assuming rank preservation, and then they talk like they're assuming rank preservation. So practice can be improved here, would be my thought. It's hard. It's hard to write it without sounding like you're assuming rank preservation. Uh, and people want to assume rank preservation. And I'm fine with that if you make an explicit case about why rank preservation is reasonable to assume in your substantive context. And you do the, the Bittler, Gelbach, and Hoynes test. But is there any yeah? gaps in between like, rank preservation and like, it seems like they're both like the same Well, be careful. I think the distinction between quantile treatment effects at and quantile treatment effects on is a distinction between making assumption about the rank, the rank correlation and not making an assumption. The other way to think about this is the rank correlation can go from minus one to one, right? And this is an exercise that we do in Heckman, Smith, and Clements, although I'm not talking about it here, is that we, we sort of do an exercise where we move the rank correlation from minus one up to one in the JDPA data and we show the implications of different rank correlations for what features of the treatment effect distribution look like. Uh, so you could, and in the original version of that paper, it actually had this kind of casual Bayesian flavor where we had a prior over the rank correlation, and then we kind of integrated over the prior to say stuff about our beliefs about the distribution of treatment effects. That stuff all got taken out. I don't remember if we took it out or the editor made us take us out. But you could think about it that way, right? Maybe you think that the real rank correlation is like 0.9, that basically there is people who do well in the labor market and people who don't, but there's some, you know, the, the treatment may move people around a little bit from their, from their place in the, in the untreated ranking. You can proceed conditional on that. Now, the thing that's unique about the distributions of outcomes when the, or the distribution of impacts when the rank correlations are one and minus one is that they are unique. That's what's unique about them is that they're unique. There's only one joint distribution that has a rank correlation of one. There's only one joint distribution that has a rank correlation of minus one. There are a very large number of distributions with a rank correlation of 0.8. And actually, one of the things that took some effort in that paper was figuring out how to draw a random sample from the population of joint distributions that had a rank correlation of 0.8. That can be a homework problem today. <laughs> um, so do you see this? So I, there's two contrasts, right? Assumption versus no assumption and rank preservation versus, versus some other explicit assumption about the joint distribution. And I wanted to distinguish those two in response to your question. All right. Uh, you can do conditional and unconditional quantile treatment effects. Maybe this is the last thing I'll do in these notes. Uh, and here my example is uh, the Michigan Medical School salary study, which I was involved with with my friend and colleague Paul Courant uh, at Michigan. So we were commissioned by the higher ups at the university to contribute to a series of studies that had been done looking at gender differences in compensation, or I should say sex differences in compensation, uh, among Michigan faculty. And so 10 years before, there had been a study done in the medical school that looked at differences between male and female faculty, and they had found substantively non-trivial differences in compensation, they had done an exercise where they predicted, where they looked at residuals from the regression line. Basically, they sent the dean, the output of that evaluation was a thing that went to the dean that say, these people, these female faculty members, are way below the regression line. You should think about them and give some of them raises. And the medical school thought about them, gave some of them raises, and gave some of the money back because they decided that they had done all the raises they needed to do, which is a very odd thing in an, any administrative context to give money back uh, that you could spend on making your employees happier. But that's what they did. So then we come along 10 or 15 years later, and we're doing this follow-up study. And my value added to this enterprise was to say, hey, let's do quantile treatment effects. That'll be interesting. And the reason um, that I'm using this as an example here is 
This is a very nice example of a case where people's quantiles may differ a lot depending on what you condition on, right? So if you look at the unconditional salary distribution, uh, the women are on average heavily concentrated in the lower quantiles. But a very important part of the reason for that is that women didn't start becoming professors in medical school until 25 years ago or 20 years ago. And so the senior faculty are almost all men. And then the assistant professors are many more women relative to the men. And so the unconditional distribution confounds gender differences or sex differences in compensation with sex differences in seniority, right? And so we're going to condition on some stuff. And what we condition on is substantively important here. So one thing we condition on is rank. Now, there's an issue that the promotion process, too, might be tainted by discrimination against women. And so we do a set of estimates that do condition on rank. We do a set of estimates that don't condition on rank. We do condition always on time to degree, time since your degree, so roughly age. Uh, we condition on uh, departments right within the medical school. We condition on whether you have an MD, a PhD, or both. Turns out having a PhD in the medical school means you earn less. Because uh, it, mean, <laughs> it means you don't practice. And some of, med some of medical salaries are implicitly kickbacks from the income the university earns from your practice. Um, oh, it's, it's all very it's tawdry, as you learn. Uh, and we condition on. Uh, whether you're getting an administrative bonus or not, right? So if you're chair of the department, you get a little bump up for a while and stuff, right? First interesting fact, not related to the discussion here, but still interesting, the R squared from just the department indicators is 0.8, right? So the, the story number one here, beyond anything else, is surgeons get paid a lot more than some other fields, right? That, that, that's, you know, 80% of the variance in compensation is just what department you're in which I was not prepared for. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, the point, there's two points here for this discussion of quantile treatment effects. One is conditional quantiles are different than unconditional quantiles. I already made that point. The second thing here is that it turned out the quantile treatment effects were pretty interesting. And so what turns out to be true in the Michigan Medical School, and you can find this study on my webpage. It's also buried somewhere on the provost's office webpage, that the quantile treatment effect uh, on being female at the low quantiles is approximately zero, but it increases monotonically with the conditional quantile. And so what seems to be true is the conditional on X, you have, uh, yeah, we can be completely stereotypical and make that the men, and uh, yeah, I'll get in trouble, we'll do, we'll do yellow. We'll do maize and blue, since I'm still in Michigan for a couple more months. Um, but it kind of is like that. It's not quite right. The, the, basically, the lower half of the distribution of the outcome distribution for men and women is about the same, conditional on the stuff I told you. Now, we make no claims here to have solved the selection problem. We are not conditioning on any measures of of scholarly productivity or teaching quality or service. We're just trying to take some, get rid of some residual variation. Quantile 0 through 50, basically the men and women look the same. Men have a, a longer right tail. And the result of that is that the quantile treatment effects march up in magnitude as you go up the distribution. So that's kind of cool if you think about the underlying behavior, the underlying social science in that if, you're, if your model is, well, OK, the powers that be at the medical school just pay all women less, that's clearly not true. right? You need to have some sort of mechanism that is different for people at the upper part of the distribution, for the stars, than you do for the sort of the regular line faculty who are down here. And so this is, you, you need to start telling a story or start, if you wanted to investigate this further and think about writing up a paper or something like that, you would want to go down roads of, well, are outside offers different for men and women? Is the proclivity to go get outside offers, right? Because outside offers are what push you up into the tail. Is that proclivity different for men and women? When they do do it, the offers they get, are those different for men and women? Is the university's response to outside offers different for men and women? 
But it needs, it, it helps you sort among models to look at the quantile treatment effects. Right? Whereas if we'd only looked at the mean and said, oh, okay, on average, uh, conditional on the stuff that we condition on, men make 5% more or something like that. That's informative. It says, okay, there's something going on here that we need to study, but we get extra stuff out of looking at the quantile treatment effects because looking at the quantile treatment effects helps us eliminate certain models of where that average difference might come from. And also I think helps us, points us to kind of we need a model, we need a mechanism that has this feature that it generates a differential upper tail, but not a differential lower tail. So the second pitch I wanted, or the last pitch I wanted to make on this slide about the quantile treatment effects is they can be useful in thinking about models and thinking about mechanisms. Yes? So I immediately see how this is very useful because we're naturally concerned to think about these pay differences. On the other hand, I just want to point out we've moved from talking about randomized experiments. Yeah where the treatment is yep. your assignment to talking about the treatment is your sex. Yeah, and are there that's not randomly assigned. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Are there to the interpretation that we should have because of this? Like, well, there are talking about reassigning a man to be a woman or? I don't, I don't even want to assume, necess I don't necessarily want to assume even rank preservation here, yeah. right? I just want to talk about, this is a conditional outcome distribution and we have summarized it by looking at these quantile treatment effects. And I think that in so doing, by summarizing these two distributions, these two outcome distributions using the quantile treatment effects, some light has been shed on what may be going on with compensating, compensation practices in Michigan's medical school. These are not causal in any sense. Now, Berkeley, there's a study, uh, they did a salary study too. There's a whole industry of these salary studies, actually. Uh, and Berkeley did one that was substantially more ambitious than the one that Paul and I did at Maryland. And for a subset of the faculty, for I think it was three different disciplines, they actually went out and collected data on publications, and I think citations. And they have a section on that. That's where this is going. There, I might be willing to think a bit more about you know, pushing my continuous causal compellingness measure up from zero to six or something on a scale of one to 10, or zero to 10. Uh, that's interesting reading, by the way. That, you that's think they're stage. controlling for more and better things? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, this is, I was talking to some folks uh, during the break, I think, about this. That, or was I talking about it at the end of the lecture? So I'll focus on the one. I, I don't think of causality as binary. Like, this is a causal study and this is not a causal study. There are certainly studies that are explicitly not causal that just say we're trying to measure this better. Oftentimes those studies are very useful. But then I think about causal studies, and some people like to say that failed causal studies are descriptive studies, and I don't like to say that. I like to say a failed causal study is a, is a failed causal study, right? They were trying to do something causal and they didn't do a very good job. That's different than just starting out and saying, I'm just gonna measure this. I'm gonna tell you what's happened to internal migration in the US over the last 20 years in a careful way, right? That's a descriptive paper. And I like to think causality, is, as being not the causality itself, but the compellingness of the evidence as being a continuous variable and not a binary variable. Like this is a good paper and that's a bad paper. You know, there's papers that are really good, there's papers that are pretty good, there's papers that are okay, and there's papers that are just not very compelling. And I, I wish we would talk about them in that way instead of, I think oftentimes this kind of binary categorization. And we could then, now I only have 45 minutes left. We could, we could go on to a riff about how we do meta-analysis. There's some slides about meta-analysis on here. Uh, because meta-analysis is a tool for aggregating information across studies. And I would like people who do meta-analysis to grade the papers, right? To read it and say, you know, this is pretty good. This is, you know, and then you could do various weighted averages and things, right? Or you could stick the grade in as a, as a covariate in your meta-regression. Uh, people are very reticent, not surprisingly, to grade each other's papers. So what usually happens is that people will stick in features that might be correlated with the causal compellingness, right? So there's this very nice set of papers now by Card, Kluve, and Weber meta-analyzing uh, the results of active labor market program evaluations. And they stick in an indicator for whether the study was experimental or not. 
right, whether it's a randomized controlled trial or not. And in their thing, the coefficient on that indicator is approximately zero. It's statistically zero and it's not very big. And that was very surprising to me. Now, they didn't do a regression, which would have been interesting to see if the variance uh, is higher. For, I suspect that the variance is higher for non-experimental studies. I don't know that. Um, that's kind of an optimistic sort of conclusion. Now, it's driven a lot by job search experiments. So maybe you don't like it as much, but yeah. Um, anyway, that's getting me far afield. Any other questions about quantile stuff? I'm going to spend the remaining 40 minutes, 45 minutes on the second lecture. OK. This is, I always, there is an asymmetric loss function. It's worse to have too much material than it is to have too little. But I get really carried away, and I always have way, way too much. But that's, oh well. Better, ooh. L. Better to go through some of it slowly and have people get it and be excited about it than to try to whiz through all of it. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about this literature that uses experiments as benchmarks. I don't know that we'll get through all this stuff. So this is the literature, and again, it's appropriate to discuss this here in Chicago because this is the literature that started with Robert Lalonde's dissertation. And Bob spent most of his career here at Chicago. He was an assistant professor in what was then just the Graduate School of Business. Uh, he did not get tenure in the Graduate School of Business. He spent some time at Michigan State, and then uh, he came back as a tenure professor at the Harris School. And today he's unfortunately pretty ill, but, uh, but still hangs out at the Harris School some. And his idea, which is a clever idea, was to say, OK, now we've done some experiments, right? So these, his paper is, this is his job market paper published in 1986. At that point, there had been just a handful of experimental evaluations of things in the US. He's going to use the data from one of them, the National Support of Work Demonstration. The NITs had already taken place. The negative income tax experiments had already taken place. But it's early days for experiments. And he has this idea and says, you know, mostly we're not doing experimental methods. Wouldn't it be interesting to take one of these experiments, say, here's truth and then cover our eyes and pretend we don't have the control group and use the treatment group data from the experiment combined with a non-experimental comparison group, pound on that data like we usually would with econometrics, and see if the results that we get look like the results from the experiment. Right? That's the way that Lond is thinking and what this whole literature is thinking about what he's doing. And that's a very clever idea. It's a second use of experiments. Right? Normally we just think, oh, experiment gives us this really credible estimate of the mean impact. But another use of experimental data is to teach us about how well we do the rest of the time when we're not doing experiments, to learn about the performance or the plausibility or when certain non-experimental identification strategies and estimators perform well, excuse me, and when they perform poorly. All right, key points. Uh, I already said the first two. We can learn a lot. So the literature calls these within study designs. This is a phrase that comes from a guy called Tom Cook. I guess there's people here who are from education land will have heard of Tom Cook. He's a very big guy in that world. Does a lot of stuff on regression discontinuity and so on. Um, delightful character if you ever get to meet him. I'm not sure. I've never been quite sure that I'm happy with this name within study designs, but I think we're stuck with it. Um, I'm going to argue in this lecture, and I have argued in this recent paper, so the, the, um, the special issue of the Journal of Labor Economics just came out a week or two ago. Uh, it's a special issue in honor of Bob Lalonde, and um, based on a conference that the folks at Princeton, he did his PhD at Princeton under Orley, um, had in his honor. And I have a paper in there with a student of mine called Sebastian Kalanico that replicates some of what Bob did. And so the stuff is, is fresh in my mind. And some of these points that I'm making here in the lecture today are also made in that paper with Sebastian. So I'm going to argue that, that the literature is not very careful in thinking about what is learned from these studies. And in particular, that it's not very careful about distinguishing learning about identification strategies from learning about estimators. And I'll make more, I'll make more plain what I mean by that going forward. 
Uh, and I will make this point in the context of this aligned literature. So there's a sequence of papers that use the supported work data, and then there's also the Heckman et al. papers using the data from the Job Training Partnership Act. And that's, that's the set of papers we're going to kind of talk about for the remaining 40 minutes. Uh, if there is time, I will mention what I think is very important and something that I think is also underdone in the literature, which is that we can also use experiments to tell us something about structure. Uh, we can you know, wander outside of treatment effect land and use experiments as benchmarks to help us learn about models. And maybe that's a good thing that we ought to be doing as well. Okay, uh, we're in treatment effects land. I'm gonna be careful about distinguishing between a comparison group and a control group. So I'm gonna refer to control group as just something that comes from an experiment. So people are randomly assigned to a treatment group or a control group in an experiment. So it's non-participants that result from randomization. Whereas I'm going to use comparison group to mean observational non-participants. So non-participants that result from regular choices by people to participate or not in a program. An experimental estimate compares a treatment group and a control group. A non-experimental estimate compares a treatment group and a comparison group. Okay. Now I want to distinguish between identification and estimation. So I think of an identification strategy as a substantive economic claim about the data generating process that allows a causal interpretation of a resulting estimate. So conditional independence is a substantive economic claim, right? It is implicitly, though not explicitly, a model, right? If I say, if I condition on x1 through x10 and I tell you what x1 through x10 are, then I have solved the problem of non-random selection into my program, that is a substantive economic claim, right? That's a claim about the world, that, that within subsets of people defined by x1 through x10, participation is unrelated to the untreated outcome. That's a bold claim, but it's a claim that is sometimes true, I would argue, in the literature. Bias stability, right, BSA common trends, whatever you want to call it, the substantive assumption that underlies application of the difference in differences estimator. That is a substantive economic claim. It says that the mean outcomes of this group and the mean outcomes of my participants would proceed in parallel in the absence of the treatment. Right? That is a substantive economic claim. That is identification. RD right, is a substantive economic claim. It says, this treatment was handed out according to this rule, and there was no manipulation. All right? That's a substantive economic claim. An estimation strategy is a rule for manipulating data to produce an estimate. Particular estimators are consistent under particular identifying assumptions. So if I assume conditional independence, then matching will produce consistent estimates. If I match on those variables that I think yield conditional independence, matching will produce consistent estimates under certain assumptions. As will the parametric linear model, as long as I promise to keep adding terms. Or if I'm willing to assume not only that conditional independence assumption holds, but that I've got the right functional form. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. So this is why I want to distinguish this here, right? In particular, this literature is going to have papers that, that look at different identifying assumptions, and it's going to have papers that assume conditional independence and then look at different estimators. And those are different epistemic projects, right? They're both interesting epistemic projects. Epistemology is just highbrow word for philosophy of science, uh, epistemic being the adjective form. But the literature confuses the two, uh, as I will show you with some actual quotes. This is going to be kind of an old school paper, and since I'm actually going to quote sentences from these papers to, to make my points. Um, I tend to think of identification as being the economics part of the exercise, and estimation as being the econometric or statistical part of the exercise. That is not meant to, to provide a hierarchy. They're just different. They're different tasks, and they're different questions. And we need to be careful in distinguishing between the two. Uh, so I already said that about Tom Cook. So this is the literature I'm going to talk about, right? So Lalonde 86, right? It's well-cited paper, 
1650 Google citations. That was a year or so ago. It's probably up to 1700 now. Heckman Hutz had an immediate rejoinder uh, to Lalonde in 89. Together, the Lalonde paper and the Heckman Hutz paper, plus the results of a set of evaluations of the predecessor program to the Job Training Partnership Act, which produced estimates that were all over the map, even though they used the same data. Uh, those three things together, Lalonde plus the CETA evaluations plus the Heckman Hutz paper, convinced the Department of Labor in the US to do a randomized control trial of the Job Training Partnership Act. That was viewed as a big deal at the time because it was the first major randomized control trial of an ongoing program. All right, so supported work was a demonstration program. It existed only to be evaluated. Right? Negative income tax was a demonstration program. It existed only to be evaluated. JTPA was in place and going. And they did a random assignment experiment on top of that. That was viewed as a big deal at the time, to put random assignment into a pre-existing program. And so because of the, the Lawn paper, because of the heckman Hutz paper, because of the Lawn paper and the CETA stuff, they decided to do an experiment. Because of the heckman Hutz paper, for reasons I will describe, they decided to also build in a non-experimental evaluation to facilitate a high quality within study design analysis. And then they hired Heckman and Hutz to do that analysis, and they hired me to help them. That's how I ended up writing about all this stuff in my dissertation. Uh, so we'll talk about the, the lessons from that literature a little bit. Then we'll go back to supported work. So there's this also very well-cited and famous paper by Rajiv Dehija, who you may have heard of, and Sadek Waba, who you probably haven't because he went off to Wall Street to make money after graduate school that brought matching to the supported work literature. And it was partly responsible for the enthusiasm for matching around the turn of the millennium. And then Smith and Todd is a response to Dehesh and Waba, and then Kalanico and Smith, for the moment, the final word on the matter, although I'm trying to write one more paper. I'm trying to swear off of supported work papers, but I wanna, I wanna write one more. All right, so what's up with the lawn? The way I read Lalonde's paper is that he's looking for the magic bullet. He's looking for the estimator. And again, it's very cloudy, right? So he says, the goal is to assess the likely ability of several econometric methods to accurately assess the economic benefits of employment and training programs. Excuse me. Is an econometric method an identification strategy or is it an estimator or some of both? It's not clear. And in fact, Bob does some of both in his paper without being really clear about what he's up to. So I view his paper, and the literature kind of views his paper, as being part of a search for the strategy that's always and everywhere going to solve the problem of non-random selection of the programs. That's what I call the magic bullet. Um, you have to remember that at this point in time, right, this is the heyday of the bivariate normal selection model, and the associated two-step estimator that helped make Huckman's career, right? And the two-step estimator of the bivariate normal selection model was, was viewed at the time, for a time, as precisely such a magic bullet. I mean, it's hard to convey now, because you've all been taught about, oh, functional form assumptions, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. But I can remember sitting in seminars, in the Becker-Rosen seminar, and somebody would be presenting a paper, and somebody in the audience would raise their hand and say, well, what do you do about the selection problem? And the speaker would say, I did the Heckman two-step. And that would end the discussion of the selection problem. I mean, it, it, it's, it's hard to convey how that could be true, but it was true. Um, the second point I want to highlight here is that Bob does not spend a lot of time talking about the data. The rest of the literature is going to evolved to talking more about the data, but at this time, and it wasn't just Bob, it was everybody in this literature. It was method. We gotta find the method. We gotta find the cool estimator that's gonna solve our problem and make us happy. That's how it was framed. All right, so what did he do? So he takes the treatment group data from the supported work experiment, and he combines that with two non-experimental comparison groups. One of them is drawn from the PSID. The other is drawn from the CPS. Now, this is something 
that you'd be very unlikely to do now, I think, to draw comparison groups from big national survey data sets. But it was relatively common at the time. So the CETA evaluations that I mentioned that had produced these estimates were all over the map. Their comparison group was drawn from the CPS, from the Current Population Survey. What's the problem with these two possible comparison groups? Well, the problem with CPS is it doesn't have very many X's, but it has big N. The problem with the PSID is it has lots of X's and not much N. So in that sense, we've kind of spanned the two, the two kinds of dysfunction. Uh, Bob imposes a few limits, and in fact, he has, he has a set of, of subsamples of his comparison groups that impose more or less kind of crude limits on the characteristics of the people in the comparison group. Uh, but basically, he just tried to kind of take a broad brush set of, of relatively poor people from the comparison groups and make them his comparison group and then let the estimators do their work. Let me tell you about the experiment. So the support of work demonstration uh, was designed to see what would happen if you threw a whole lot of money at people who had real serious labor market difficulties. So there were four... Uh, subgroups that were separately randomly assigned and for whom the program was separately operated. So long-term welfare recipients, high school dropouts, ex-convicts, and ex-addicts. So Lalonde, again for sample size reasons, says, okay, I'm going to combine these people into two groups. So he takes the men from the high school dropout group, from the ex-addict group, and from the ex-convict group. Now, turns out, basically all the ex-convicts and all the ex-addicts are men. Too bad. Men, men are less well-behaved than women. Uh, about half the high school dropouts are men. So the, this male group is this funny mix of ex-addicts, ex-convicts, and high school dropouts, but they're not in population proportion, right? Relative to the population, there's way too many ex-addicts and ex-convicts. But this is not discussed in the paper. And that makes it, I mean, I don't think you would do this if you were doing it now. I don't think you would combine the ex-addicts, the ex-convicts, and the, the dropout men, but that's what's done. And then the other group was the, just the AFDC women, so the single moms. Treatment was randomly assigned when I was in high school, so 1976 and 77. Uh, you all were not born yet. And there's 10 sites around the country. For the men, all the sites are in cities. For the women, one of the sites is not in a city. That will matter later. So what identification strategies does Bob consider? He considers conditional dependence. He doesn't frame it this way, by the way. I'm, I'm putting this gloss onto his paper ex post. He considers uh, conditional dependence with just demographics and education. I don't think anyone would believe that, but it's kind of a base case. And then he con considers conditional independence with that plus lagged earnings, which is a little bit more plausible, but it's, it's kind of one year of lagged earnings and measured at the annual level. So maybe you're not as happy about that. He does difference and differences, so he's buys stability uh, or common trends. And then he looks at the, at the bivariate normal selection model. Um, there's several issues with that. Um, he does it both with and without exclusion restrictions. So having actual exclusion restrictions, so variables that were in the participation equation but not in the outcome equation, that was super duper good behavior at the time. Right? That was a period when you could still publish papers that did the bivariate normal model with the same variables in the participation outcome equation, so that identification was coming solely from the normal functional form. Right? Can't, can't, haven't been able to do that for a long time. But that's, that was the time. So what are the covariates that are being relied on for selection unobserved variables? So they are, and the problem here is right, that Bob is limited to covariates that appear in both the experimental data, and in the PSID and the CPS. So that limits the set of available covariates to age, black and Hispanic, years of schooling, married, and high school completion. Now, if I put that out there to you and say, I'm going to assume conditional independence for this program that is designed to serve very hard to serve people who are having severe labor market difficulties in 10 specific local labor markets, and I'm going to draw my comparison group from a nationally representative data set. And I'm just going to maybe throw out a few people. And I'm going to assume that conditioning linearly on these solves the selection problem. You would make a funny face at me, I think. You should make a funny face at me. But those were different days. So 
what's the outcome variable? Uh, the outcome variable is measured differently for the different groups. So for the support of work data, there is a survey. For the support of work treatment group, there is a survey that measures earnings in a particular way. The PSID has a survey that measures earnings in a particular way. Those questions are not the same, though they are similar. And for the CPS, there is matched administrative data. And we know from the subsequent literature that matched administrative data has different properties for earnings than survey responses for earnings for the same people. Dependent variable real earnings in 79, leg dependent variables real earnings in 1975. Now, there's an issue there too with temporal alignment that isn't discussed in Bob's paper. So people are being randomly assigned in 1976 and 1977. The thing you really want to condition on, think about the model that we started with right, earlier this morning, you want to condition on earnings in the period right before people decide to participate or not because you're concerned about Ashenfelter's dip. For people who are randomly assigned in January 76, earnings in 1975 is what you would like to condition on. For people who are randomly assigned in April 1977, earnings in 1975 leave a 14-month gap between the decision to participate and the timing of the lagged earnings measure. That's another issue with what was done in this paper, not discussed in the paper. What are the exclusion restrictions that are used in the bivariate normal model? Employment status in April 1976. Well, that's a little odd since some of the people are randomly assigned in January 1976. Uh, number of children, you used to be able to get away with that. Urban residents. So I mentioned to you that all the sites for the men where random assignment took place were in urban areas. And so if you go to replicate the bivariate normal selection model for the men, using urban residents as the exclusion restriction, status spits out an error message and says, ah, but this is a perfect one-way predictor, right? Everybody who is treated is in an urban area, but not everybody in an urban area is treated, right? And so it, it drops the variable. This is how we, I, ha I hate to say this, right, because it's, it's, it's clear if you think about it, but we didn't think about it, nobody thought about it. Um, this is how Petra and I discovered it in our paper was, oh, Stata tells us this is an error message. I guess this is not a valid uh, exclusion restriction variable for this group. <coughs> Whatever program, so Bob is probably using somebody's SAS IML code or somebody's Fortran program to do the probit. It had no error message to detect perfect one-way predictors. It just went off and estimated something. Who knows what it was? Uh, so probably you don't want to put a lot of weight on those estimates. All right, this is too small for you to see. This is page 610 of Bob's paper. Uh, what I want you to take away from it, which I think is visible from a distance, is that the estimates are all over the map, right? So he does all these different identification strategies and blah, 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 and he gets estimates that are all over the map. And some of them are like the experimental estimates, but most of them are not. And he argues that there's sort of no good way to pick a priori the ones that are going to turn out to be like the experimental estimates and the ones that are not. And therefore, I think this is on the next slide, uh, policymakers should be aware that the available non-experimental evaluations may contain large and unknown biases resulting from specification errors. I'm not sure that specification error is the right word here, not the word I would pick, but that's what he said. Absolutely. The conclusion that the literature drew from this paper was an odd one. The conclusion was, this part is not odd, that we needed to do experiments to evaluate active labor market programs because non-experimental stuff couldn't work. Oddly, this conclusion did not extend to any other policy domains. This is another thing I've never understood. People became extremely suspicious about observational studies for this class of treatment, but not for other classes of treatment. That's a funny notion of external validity. Um, as I mentioned, Bob's paper directly, in a very obvious sense, if you go back and read the documentation from the committee that was set up to design the JTPA study, Bob's paper was really important in getting them to do a randomized control trial. Uh, I think indirectly, Bob's paper would partly spawn the credibility revolution. So we'll, we'll give it all kinds of weight here. Um, as I mentioned, it didn't seem to condemn all empirical work in applied micro. Maybe you would think it should. All right, I said that, I said that, I said that. Okay, boom, boom, boom. This is my alternative reading of the paper, uh, which, which benefits from the subsequent literature and what it has learned. 
My reading of the paper is that the data are much of the problem, not the methods, particularly for the men. Uh, as I already kind of foreshadowed, I don't think you would ever expect conditional independence to hold here for the men. So think about it, right? For the male sample, you have combined high school dropouts, ex-addicts, and ex-convicts. And you're attempting to solve the selection problem with some demographics and one year of lagged earnings. You have no variables to do anything with drugs, and you have no variables to do anything with crime, even though a bunch of your sample is ex-convicts and a bunch of your sample is ex-addicts. Right? The face kind of a priori face validity here is modest at best for conditional independence. What about bias stability? Well, you saw the graph. You saw that selection on transitory shocks is very important to JTPA data. It's very important here, too. And if you have selection on transitory shocks, then bias stability is not going to hold in general. And difference in differences is going to be very sensitive to the timing of the before period, because where you pick the before period in relation to the dip is going to matter a lot for the estimates that you get out. So I don't think we really want to believe the diff and diff estimates here, too. And I think that if you, if you had known what we know now and then thought about this exercise a priori, you would not have expected bias stability to hold here. And I already kind of criticized the bivariate normal model estimates. Uh, nobody would expect now those to hold without an exclusion restriction. And the exclusion restrictions are all problematic for one reason or another. So and. And uh, we have this alignment problem. And we measure the outcome variable differently for the treated and untreated units. Right? SSA earnings are not the same as survey earnings. And so if you find an impact when you compare treated units with survey earnings to untreated units with SSA earnings, Social Security Administration earnings, you don't know if, if what you're picking up is a program <laughs> impact or if what you're picking up is a systematic measurement error difference. Right? Maybe administrative data, on average, give you lower earnings for this population than survey earnings do. Well, then we're measuring the effect of the instrument that was used to calculate, to construct the earnings measure, not the effect of the treatment. Right? There's tons of reasons, and I say this, and I want to be clear. Bob is a super smart guy who I really like a lot. But He's writing in 1986. Now it's 2017. We've learned a lot since then. And I think it's important because of the huge influence that this paper has had to go back and say, wait a minute. How does this paper look in hindsight? How should we think about this paper? Are we interpreting the message of this paper, which a lot of the people who refer to it have never read or thought about in, the, in a detailed way in relation to the subsequent literature? Are we interpreting the message of this paper correctly? And the case that I want to make and that we make in Smith and Todd and that we make in Klonico and Smith is no, we're probably not taking the right message away from this paper. The right message away to take away from this paper is probably data matters a lot. All right. So what do Heckman Hutz do? Right? So this is my committee now, Heckman Hutz and Lalonde. That's pretty cool. Um, they managed to get administrative data on both the supportive work people and the CPS comparison group. So as best I can tell, that administrative data, both sets of administrative data have now disappeared. No, I think just the CPS administrative data have disappeared. I've been trying to get it. If you know where it is, let me know. But I've been unsuccessful so far. The administrative data for the supported work people is grouped for confidentiality reasons. So that means you can't use nonlinear estimators because the expected value of a nonlinear function of something isn't the nonlinear function of the expected value. The supported work survey data also have a lot of attrition. That's a whole other aspect of this that we won't go into. So their paper focuses on conditional independence and bias stability, as well as selection on trends, what they call the random growth model. Their conclusion is that if you take seriously a regime of specification testing, so there, this is the thing that they want to push at the time. And this is something I think Jim has backed off of a bit in the subsequent decades. But what they wanted to push was, look, Bob just didn't didn't push hard enough on the data. He didn't think enough about the, the over-identifying restrictions implicit in some of these models. And if you really push hard on doing specification tests, then you can throw out all the estimates that are qualitatively different from the experiment, where qualitatively different means sign and statistical significance. So they come to a much more positive conclusion. right? It's not that they you know, nail the experimental estimate 
on the head with any of the non-experimental stuff that they do. But they argue that if you're more rigorous about the specification testing, so in particular, they kind of import the so-called pre-programmed test into this literature where you estimate the treatment effect in the pre-period using, using whatever identification strategy it is. And if the treatment effect in the pre-period is zero, right, nobody's been treated yet, that gives you confidence in whatever you, number you get for the treatment effect in the post-period. Right? That was an innovation to bring that test into this literature. So they're more positive, and they, they were so positive, and they went and presented in front of the people who were deciding what to do for evaluating the JTPA study. They made this, you know, very forceful, positive presentation, arguing that, hey, we shouldn't give up on non-experimental methods. If we take them more seriously and do these specification tests, they can reproduce the experimental estimates in a kind of qualitative sense. Right? Samples aren't big in the support of work data, so you don't want to get too carried away about the point estimates. But in a qualitative sense, you can get rid of the really inconsistent estimates. So for that reason, they spent $5 million on this non-experimental JTPA study uh, that I wrote about in my dissertation. Um, so what did that look like? So the JTPA study, uh, Non-random, that's a whole other story about how they pick the sites. But 16 of the 600 sites nationwide participated in this evaluation. At four of them, they constructed this comparison group data, this ideal comparison group data. It was ideal in the following senses, right? Same survey instrument, same local labor market. Everyone in the comparison group was determined to be eligible using the eligibility criteria for the program. So there's often an issue when you go to generate comparison groups that the eligibility rules will require information that you don't have available in the comparison group data, right? And so you can only approximate eligibility. Here they went around with screener instruments. I have them in my basement. This may scare you. Um, they went around with screener instruments and you know, just went through for each person in the household whether they were eligible or not. And if they weren't eligible, they, they weren't at risk of being administered the comparison group survey. And they constructed detailed employment earnings and labor force status histories at a relatively fine level of temporal detail with the idea that what we had learned from the preceding literature, this Ashenfelter paper I mentioned, there's another paper by Card and Sullivan in Econometrica that's very nice. What we had learned from that literature was that it's really, really crucial to condition on pre-program outcomes because those pre-program outcomes are going to capture both eta and epsilon in the model that I put up at the beginning. And we need to do that because we have learned that there is selection, it seems, on both eta and epsilon into the program that's not going to be picked up by standard demographic and educational characteristics. All right, we also did some stuff with the SIP. I'm not going to talk about that. Basically, the JDPA papers are all about conditional independence and about bias stability. And with rich sets of covariates, blah, 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 blah. The sample size is still not big but bigger than the supported work data, especially for the adults. What do we find? Here's a bold finding. Measuring the dependent variable in the same way for the treated and untreated units matters. Who would have thought, right? How do you get into econometric growth, a paper that says you should measure the dependent variable in the same way for the treated and untreated units? Uh, that's not the only thing that we say in that paper. But, you know, it, it's kind of bizarre. It's almost comical that you have to say, well, this is one of our big findings. But as I showed you with the Lawn paper, and this was not uncommon in this literature, people didn't do it. And it matters, or it can matter. Uh, local labor markets matter. Now this is an area where I think we still have more to learn. If you, if you look across evaluations that have been done in the subsequent years, local labor, market matter, local labor markets seem to matter for some programs, but not for others. And the source of that variation is not obvious. Uh, this is something I've had on my to-do list to work on for a long time. I'd be delighted. This is one of those things where I'd be delighted if somebody else wrote the paper and then I can cross it off my list. Um, so I did an evaluation with uh, Peter Dalton in the United Kingdom of a program called the New Deal for Lone Parents. Local labor markets seem not to matter at all there. In the JTPA data, they're huge, right? So we did this exercise where we took the treated units at the four, each of the four sites and compared them to the comparison group units at a different site. 
that's a mess. Whereas if you compare them to the comparison units of the same sites, excuse me, and condition on the right set of covariates, you get very close to the experimental impact estimates. So for whatever reason, in this context, local labor markets are really important. Another thing that it seems almost comically obvious when you say it is it really matters what you condition on. If you condition on sort of what you've got in the CPS, in the JDP data, which you can do, you can dumb down the data and have a non-rich conditioning set, then you don't get very close to the experimental impacts. If you condition on the rich set of covariates motivated by that model, then you do get pretty close to the experimental impact estimates. And as I already mentioned, and this is the main purport of the economic journal paper, is that because of the Ashenfelter dip, because of the selection on transitory shocks, difference in differences strategies based on bias stability assumptions are problematic and very sensitive to the timing of the before period. All right, so that's the graph you've already seen. That's where the literature stood in 1995, right? And those papers had a big effect. People really started focusing after those papers on same local labor market, how do we measure the dependent variable in particular. Those messages seem to have big effects. All right, along come Tahiji and Waba. So they're graduate students at Harvard. And they've been working with Ruben, among others, right? And Ruben, I think, suggested to them, uh, why don't you try matching in the support of work data? Good idea. So they email Bob and Lon and say, could we have your data? We, we want to try matching out. And Bob says, here's the data on the men, but I can't send you the data on the women because at some point the tape, right, the physical round tape like in an old science fiction movie, got too close to a magnet. And so the data went away, which is too bad. So we have the Lon's data for the men, but we don't have the Lon's data for the women. So this is why the whole subsequent literature until my paper with Sebastian only looks at the men for the very prosaic reason that at some point Bob's data on the women got corrupted and, and was no longer usable. Um, the way I read the Dehesian Wava paper, and this is not exactly how they describe it, is that they're interested in assuming conditional independence and then comparing parametric linear model to matching estimators. And that's a very reasonable thing to do because the support of work data are sort of the poster child from wh for when matching might matter, right? So if we look at, oops, p hat of x. All right, so p hat of x is the propensity score, the estimated propensity score is the probability that uh, d is equal to 1 given x, right, so it's the probability of treatment here, participation. If you estimate the propensity score in the support of work data using the experimental treatment group and the CPS comparison group, that what you find is that the CPS comparison group has this gigantic mass point at zero. And then it kind of dribbles down like this. Whereas the, so this is CPS, whereas the supported work data is kind of, the density sort of looks like that. So what that's saying is that the vast majority of the CPS observations look nothing like anybody in supported work, right? That's why they have estimated frequency scores of zero. If you estimate a parametric linear model, it's all in here, right? Everybody is helping to determine what the slope coefficients are. In particular, these 90% of the comparison group that don't look anything like the treated units are driving the coefficients in your linear model. Now, maybe you don't want that because they're not really very much like the treated units. What matching does is it says, we're going to throw all these people out and just compare CPS units that look like the support of work units. This is when you would expect matching to make a difference. If the underlying conditional mean function is not linear, these guys can drive you in very weird directions because there are so many of them, right? Remember, least squares, right? It's all about the sum of squared residuals. The residuals of these units are driving the selection of the coefficients. All right, so that was their, their message, and they showed it was true. They showed that matching made a big difference for the men. And I'm, I can see that my time is running out soon. So can I have till 35? Okay. I don't, uh... so here's what they say. 
the methods we suggest are not relevant in all situations. They may be important, unobservable, or unobserved, I guess, would be better. Uh, covariates for which the propensity score method cannot account. However, rather than giving up or relying on assumptions about unobserved variables, that's a slam at the bivariate normal model, there is substantial reward in exploring first the information contained in the variables that are in italics observed. All quite correct. Um, all right. So the dehesion Waba paper had a huge impact on the literature. Right? It generated this, this massive number of matching papers uh, in applied economics. So I got a paper to referee from the Review of Economic Statistics. And it was a paper about the treatment effect of zoning in Chicago in the 30s. And the motivation section said, Dehesia and Waba have shown that propensity score matching solves the selection problem. Therefore, we apply propensity score matching to our study of zoning. Really? Really? That's a ma that, but that's the magic bullet idea, right? So it was the magic bullet of the day around the turn of the millennium was propensity score matching. Ah, miraculously, we can just go from linear regressions, which we don't believe anymore, to matching, and somehow selection problems are solved. Now again, there are situations where you may be way better off doing matching than you are doing a parametric linear model with only main effects in each variable. Absolutely. But you know, if you don't have the x's for the conditional dependence assumption, doing matching doesn't help you. Uh, and there seemed to be some confusion about that. Uh, and so I, I refereed a lot of bad matching papers. Anyway, um, I don't blame, I don't, you know, Dehesia and Waba understand this. Dehesia's a smart guy. I never met Waba. But the literature made a real hash out of this interpretation. Uh, and carried away this magic bullet notion that we now kind of recovered from, but it was, it was very much there for a while. All right, so what does Smith and Todd do? So Smith and Todd were perplexed. We were perplexed that Dehesian Waba got estimates for the men for their specific subsample of the Lalonde data, which is not the full sample. They got estimates for the men for their subsample of the data that were very close to the experimental estimates, even though People weren't in the same local labor markets, even though they didn't have a very rich set of covariates, and even though the earnings were measured in a different way. We thought we learned all those lessons from the JTPA data, that all these features of studies were really important, and yet here were Dehesia and Waba. Data had none of those key features, and yet they were getting impact estimates that looked like the experiment for their subset of the lawn data. So basically, what Smith and Todd do, and this is the two minute or one minute summary, is we poke at it, right? We poke at Dehesian Waba. Uh, and I'll confess, uh, it was a bit more robust than we expected in some sense. If you do what they did, you get what they got. And not all papers is that true. So kudos to them, right? Um, yeah, that's right here. At the same time, their analysis is incredibly sensitive to all sorts of different features of the, of the analysis. We make a case in particular that it's very sensitive to their particular subset of the data. So let me show what they did. This is taken from Smith and Todd in draft. So here are dates of random assignment for the men. And the lawn sample is this whole thing here. What Dehesian Waba do is they say, OK, we're going to take this variable zero earnings in months 13 to 24 before random assignment. This happens to be in Bob's data. Remember, they're kind of limited here by, we've got Bob's analysis file. We're not going back to the raw support of work data. And they understood from the literature that you really want to condition on lots of pre-program earnings. So you have a variable in the data that's called earnings in 1975, in calendar year 1975. And you have this other variable, earnings in months 13 to 24 before random assignment. What they're going to do is they're going to call that variable earnings in 1974, which we put in quotes throughout our paper, because it's actually not earnings in 1974, unless you happen to be randomly assigned in 1976, right? If you're randomly assigned in 1977, it's another measure of earnings in 1975. So it's all a little odd. And then they say, OK. Well, actually, they don't say this. We had, to, we had to sort of do forensic econometrics to figure this out. Um, for people who have non-zero earnings in months 13 to 24 before random assignment, 
who are randomly assigned late are early, uh, late, we're going to throw them out. But if they have zero earnings in months 13 to 24 before random assignment, we're going to keep them in. And they don't explicitly justify this, but we think that the argument they had in their heads was zeros are pretty stable. And so we're willing to treat this as a proxy for earnings in 1974 for these people if they had zero, but we're not willing to treat it as a proxy if they didn't have zero. So their sample is this L shape here rather than the whole thing. So we do an analysis that just uses the bottom eight cells. So the people randomly assigned in the first four months of 1976, we call that the early random assignment sample. So for those people, it's very clear that earnings in months 13 to 24 before random assignment are approximately earnings in 1974. What you do in part, when you just pick these people out and leave out these people, is that you make the dip a lot less severe, right? Because you're, you're selecting on these people with very stable zero earnings. We think that's part of why they get their nice results. When you do the analysis using exactly their propensity score specification with just the early random assignment sample, which in some sense ought to be even more credible because earnings in 1974 is better aligned for that group, you get really big biases. So we feel, Rajiv disagrees, as you can read in print in his rejoinder, um, or Rajiv would disagree with this, but we feel that we've sort of shown that they got lucky. That's our argument. That they found a combination of this particular funny L-shaped sample <coughs> where the non-experimental estimate and the experimental estimate lined up other equally credible samples, either the full sample, which is not equally credible, or the early random assignment sample give you giant biases, which accords with our prior that because you don't have the same local labor markets, because you don't measure earnings in the same way, and because you don't have the right conditioning variables, you shouldn't expect the non-experimental estimates to match the experimental estimates. All right, so that's what we did, blah, 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 blah. I will end with two minutes on this paper. Uh, so, again, this paper just published in, in Jolly in a special issue. It's called The Women of the National Support of Work Demonstration. So I had been trying for a while to get a student, to talk a student into going back to the original data sets, which you can get from ICPSR for the PSID and support of work, not for the CPS, and recreating or attempting to recreate Bob's analysis file for the women, right? Which, as I mentioned, I, I've left out. There's a zillion supported work papers because it's become the go-to data set for people with new matching estimators to use to show off their estimator, even though arguably conditional independence doesn't hold in that case. All these papers about the men, no papers about the women. Let's try to recreate the women. So we did that. We went back to the raw data and tried to recreate the, the Lon's female analysis sample. We think we nailed the support of work sample. We got the same number of observations. The descriptives are very close. PSID, not quite as happy a story. Uh, our sample is about 100 bigger. And we, we poked around a lot at it. There's, some, there's a working paper version of Alon, which is basically his dissertation. There is the published version. There's a lot of information about details of how variables were coded and so on that are not in either of those two sources. And of course, it 30 years ago. Bob doesn't remember. Uh, so we figured, we gave it our best shot. This is the spirit of replication. Let's do what seems the most sensible to us, given what's written down, and then proceed with that. So we don't have exactly his PSID sample. Our sample is a little bit bigger and has a bit higher earnings. What do we find? So then we march through. We do what he did in his paper. We basically more or less get what he got in the qualitative sense, not exactly. We do what Dehesian Waba did with the women, or our approximation of it. We do what Smith and Todd did with the women, and we do a few other things. And what do we learn? We learn, I think, two main things. First of all, we learn that, consistent with a lot of evidence in the literature, women just seem to be a less difficult selection problem than men. And I think that part of that gets back to the question earlier on about the earnings differences between the men and women. Uh, the women are on AFDC, right? They're kind of a, be, precisely because of that fact, they're a much more homogeneous group than the men. 
and it seems to be easier to solve their selection problem. You can get very low bias estimates comparing non-experimental estimates using the PSID in the women to experimental estimates. If basically all you do is only take women in the PSID who are single moms and were on AFDC for at least a month in 1975, that basically suffices to get you to the experimental impact estimate. That is a much, much simpler selection problem. The other thing that's interesting compares Smith and Todd. For the men, Smith and Todd find these very big biases when they do cross-sectional matching, but if they do difference in differences, they get very low biases. And they interpret that as representing the effects of the geographic mismatch and of the measurement differences between the administrative data and the survey. Difference in differences and cross-sectional matching are almost the same for the women. And that's a puzzle, because there's no reason the women shouldn't be subject to these same measurement and geographic mismatch issues. And so that has led us, and this is where I will close, to back off uh, the conclusions from Smith and Todd a little bit, and maybe in a sense the conclusions from the JP, JTPA stuff a little bit. Because the diff and diff estimates, based on bias stability, and the cross-sectional estimates for the women don't differ very much, Whatever is causing them to differ for the men has to be specific to the men, right? It can't be a common cause like measurement differences or geographic mismatch. It has to be something specific to the men. And so Kalanico and Smith argue that the real issue with the men is that you've got these ex-addicts and ex-convicts in there, and you don't have the right conditioning variables for them. Um, so what I hope to do in the next paper and hopefully the last supportive work paper, I should say, one anecdote, and I really will stop. When I presented this at the conference for Lalonde, uh, the Kalanico and Smith paper, Josh Angris, bless his heart, raised his hand and said, I don't think you should do this. I think this is a waste of your time. <laughs> and I appreciated his honesty, and, and I think that was a signal that one should not write too many more supportive work papers. But uh, what I want to do is, two things. One is I want to just take out the male high school dropouts and look at them, right? So my conjecture, right, based on Kalanico and Smith is that for the male high school dropouts, we should be able to solve the selection problem pretty easily, that the issue is the ex-addicts and the ex-convicts. The second thing you can do, it turns out, is that the PSID actually knows who's been in jail, right, because they try to follow people. And so you could actually do an analysis of the male ex-convicts conditioning on PSID sample members who are also ex-convicts. And so, you know, get better observed variables, as I was saying before. Uh, so that's the next thing on the agenda. Anyway, thank you for your attention, listening to my rants and so on. I look forward to talking to you some more over lunch. <laughs>